Good morning. Good morning. Could I kindly ask you all to take your seats, please? Thank you. Um, so welcome. Uh, before we start this exciting event, can I please ask you all to ensure that your mobiles are silenced? Um, you will have the opportunity to ask, to ask questions after each speaker session. And let me also inform you that this event is being live streamed and you'll be able to follow it on, on our social media channels. So please use our hashtag, uh, EU Future is now, uh, to share your comments and posts with us. Um, also, at the end of the event, there will be an official photo, um, so we'll call you up on stage. And now, to officially open this event, it gives me great pleasure to welcome on stage Mr. Carl Crane, Vice President and Managing Director of EU Business School, to officially open this summit. Thank you. So, dear students, faculty members, esteemed speakers, um, it's a great honor for us to start um, three events, the first event out of three events of the fall semester. The two other events will take place on the 19th and 20th of November. We'll have the chance to welcome one of our alumni on the 19th with the Chief Operating Officer of Manchester City, the football club. He will be speaking about his career and his role that he has for the moment at Manchester City. And the day after, on the 20th of November, we'll be welcoming the President of La Caixa Bank together with the former Prime Minister of Belgium and who is now the President of ADL, who is the Liberals at the European Parliament. These events will be communicated to you uh, in the following days and week. But first of all, why are you here today? Why are you attending an artificial intelligence event while you are studying business? Because artificial intelligence and the new technologies are coming into our lives, are disruptive, and they are game changers. They will influence the way we live, we do business, and um, we socialize. That means that what you have been seeing for the last 20 years, uh, when we had uh, in 97, when Windows 97 came into our lives, computing, uh, and then 10 years ago, when Facebook and the other social medias came into our lives, is that it completely changed the way we do things on a daily basis. You probably all of you today between six and seven hours on your mobile phones. Yeah. And that is something that uh, was not there 10 years ago. Now, where do we go from here? Artificial intelligence is, uh, like I said, is a game changer. It's already implemented in some of companies. I'll give you few examples. Uh, in the HR process of, of companies, you have chat boxes with artificial intelligence <coughs> and sensors, and they are the first step before, uh, the first filter before you meet an HR manager in some of the companies. They already uh, optimize the way <coughs> we, we have our supply, uh, supply chain, uh, we, we produce products, we improve products. Um, what we are also to, to, to know, and we will discuss about this today, um, the major players in, in the markets like Facebook, Google, Amazon, are the ones who are investing massively, billions of dollars into artificial intelligence. They are the ones who are dictating already or influencing already our lives today. Mobile phones, social media, like I said before, and they want to keep that advantage towards the future. So listen today, think, try to get as much as you can out of this, and see what are the opportunities for the future, where you can make a difference in the future. What we have seen the last 20 years, the that the change will be three to four times faster in the upcoming 20 years. Okay, so I wish you a good event. And um, 
pay attention to today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Carl. I now have the pleasure to welcome on stage Mr. Misha Dola, one of the world's foremost experts in artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, 5G and robotics. I'll just give you a quick summary of Misha's curriculum, which I can assure you is very long. So Misha is a professor in wireless communications at King's College London. He is also a fellow of IEEE, the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Royal Society of Arts, the Institution of Engineering and Technology, and a distinguished member of Harvard Square Leaders Excellence. In addition, and in his spare time, he is a serial entrepreneur, composer and pianist, with five albums on Spotify, um, and he speaks six languages fluently. Uh, Misha also acts as a policy advisor to governments on all issues related to digital skills and education. So please welcome on stage with me Mr. Misha Dola, who will enlighten us all on emerging technologies and how they will disrupt business. Thank you, Misha. Thank you. <laughs> oh my God, what is going on out there? You know, 100 years ago, it uh, took about uh, 100,000 people, maybe uh, decades, to build a billion dollar company. You're thinking of companies like IBM, uh, Siemens, you know them all too well. Um, not even 20 years ago, it was a totally different uh, game. And uh, again, technology played a role here. We're talking now about a decade and maybe, you know, a thousand people building a billion dollar business, companies like uh, Google, you know, companies like Yahoo. And we're talking companies maybe a little bit down the road like Facebook. And then you walk a few steps further, the year 2010, 2014, uh, and suddenly it's just a few years, 18 months. What's up? 18 months, 20 people, billion dollar business, right? So acceleration of technology has allowed us to do things quicker, much more efficient, and get things off the table in a much shorter time. And you know, what's the future? What's the future gonna be? It's gonna be your future. That's really what we're talking about here. And that's why I'm here today. I just wanna really give you a quick recap on what type of technology will be shaping uh, the businesses you will be leading and before I can do that, I was told you're from the business school, so I don't know how much you know of technology, really. I presume some of you will be uh, uh, very skilled in that. So let me do a, a very quick survey here, and I want you to answer that question very honestly, right? So everybody who has used the internet before, please raise your hands, okay? Now hug your neighbor, okay? Can we do that? Come on, wake up, guys. What is this? Don't be embarrassed. <laughs> so it would be six o'clock in the afternoon, I would say give each other a kiss, but okay, I'll let you get off today, okay? <laughs> All right, so this is what I thought we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna structure this in three parts, okay? You can interrupt me at any time you want, just don't throw tomato as an X, okay? Uh, ask questions if you want to, no problem. Um, we're going to first talk about some of the tech enablers. That's how we're going to take it off. Um, I'm going to be talking about five technologies. If you want to know anything about any technology I don't talk about, just ask me. No problem. Then we will talk in the second part on how you combine all that stuff. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about emerging concepts uh, such as new internets emerging out of that. And finally, if we have a bit of time, I want to share some of my insights on how can you embed all that knowledge about technology into your business processes in the future. Because we want you to really be leaders and understand how to use the technology properly. Can we do that? Yeah, so let's get started. And you know, I, I thought I'll just start straight ahead with, uh, uh, with a video. Just listen in and, and I'll explain you what's happening here.
Does anybody know the song? That, that's a, oh, wow. That's normally an H test for me. You know this song. Hands up. I won't make you kiss each other again. Well, actually, yeah, it's a song from Kiss. You know that, right? So, um, so that, was a, uh, that was a cover of a cover. So the original cover was done by Maria Mena on the Kiss song, I Was Made For Loving You, and we did the cover on the cover. So what's happening here? So I'm in Berlin, uh, sitting under the Brandenburger Tor, and I'm playing the piano, and I have a hologram uh, zoomed in from London. There's this young lady, an opera singer, she's uh, in the guild hall, and she is being zoomed in in real time to Berlin. Okay, so the Guild Hall, to add to that, is London's oldest entertainment va- uh, venue. The Romans introduced that 2,000 years back. And we thought, you know what, let's marry the oldest entertainment venue with the newest technology. So we, we managed to build a link, a link on a new internet which connected London with Berlin in 20 milliseconds. Now, you have no clue what I'm talking about, but let me give you an idea. Uh, The sound card of this computer, which is up there in the studio, takes about 60 milliseconds to get just the audio signal out of the computer, okay? 60 milliseconds. Uh, We did a connection using, do you know what we used? Do you know what type of technology we used? Anybody has an idea? Did I put it on this slide? Yeah, I did. 5G. Okay, so we're the first ones to build a working 5G system across two countries. Okay, and we connected in real time these cities. And it was very emotional because I could adapt uh, in real time to the singing speed of that young lady, and she could adapt in real time to the pitch of the piano. We were literally synchronized, and geography made no difference. You know that really lousy feeling you have when you're on a Skype call because somebody is 120 milliseconds away and it doesn't feel right? It doesn't feel as if we are together like we are right now, right here? So we have finally overcome that hurdle. The future, this is the future. This is the future public internet. 5G ultra low latency, uh, 20 milliseconds. We could have done 10, we did it 20, right? So if you were the uh, manager of a really famous music band, let's say, well, you know Kiss, so let me bring up Rolling Stones or or ABBA. Do you know ABBA? Oh, I love you guys, this is great. (laughs) Oh, that's wonderful. Good education happening here. So imagine you are the manager of ABBA. Uh, what would you do with that tech? I'll let you think for a second. What could we do? Any ideas? Yeah. 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 Fantastic. You're hired. Okay. That's exactly what we're going to do. ABBA is coming back, right? So we're going to have ABBA play in different places. I work now with uh, various bands uh, uh, such as ABBA. We're currently resurrecting them. Uh, sorry for that, in case you didn't like them. Um, we're working with Massive Attack. I'm not sure you know Massive Attack, so Rob is a good buddy of mine. So what we want to do is we want to announce essentially a concert in two different countries at exactly the same time and have everybody freak out. Okay. People ask, what's going on? How can this be? I told Rob, let's do it. Come on, let's split you up. Rob told me it's not the first time we split, we split up. But anyway, so uh, we're going to do it. So, you know, 2019 is going to be an exciting year. 2020 is going to be an exciting year because we are finally able to do stuff across large geographies. And that applies to music in this case. But you can do so many things. Uh, you know, conferencing calls. You can be with your family. You can be with your kids, with your parents. Uh, you can execute business in a way you have never, ever done before. You don't need a flight. Okay, you don't need to travel. And that is a huge disruption. And really, latency is probably the most, the coolest feature of it all in 5G. I want you to remember this. 5G will be more, more data rate. You will, you will experience it once the 5G logo appears on your phone. But really, the, 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 the magic is this very low latency, right? That's really what's going to bring us together. Um, and it's important because the human vortex works on 10 milliseconds, okay? So the human, remember that, human vortex works on 10 milliseconds. Anything which happens within 10 milliseconds, we experience as if it is with us. We call that that feeling of immediacy, right? So we're able to do that with 5G finally. What's the other cool feature? Reliability. So we get a reliability which is so awesome that we can suddenly get rid of all the cables, right? So you don't need cables anymore to get your comms done. And why is that important? Well, look at Heathrow, Terminal 6. 
So Terminal 6, we're building terminals. Has any, you have been to Heathrow, I presume, right? So we have uh, you know, T1 T to 5, uh, the first terminals are non-active. But we're building now with a runway, third runway, we're building the, the sixth terminal. Now the sixth terminal will have no walls, all right? Just a roof. Because anybody who lived in the UK knows that the temperature is always at the same level. It's always 10 degrees, but you know, it's what it is. So they figured out, hey, you know what? If we build a structure where the roof actually goes down to the ground, but leaves the sides open uh, with uh, minimum air conditioning, we can actually maintain that as a very good uh, uh, temperature. Then, you know, the whole air conditioning has been solved. Uh, fresh air comes in and out. We have trees in there. We have a park in there with animals coming in and out, birds flying in and out. In fact, you know, the whole experience of you going through the airport is going to be totally differently. That's what we want to do. Colin calls me up, the chief technology officer, Misha, I have a problem. Because with trees and grass being there, I don't know where to connect my cables anymore. I have a lot of optics there, a lot of fiber, a lot of internet connecting all my, you know, all my devices which run Heathrow really. I don't know how to do it. I said, no worries, uh, Colin, we're going to use 5G. So what we're doing now is we are looking on how to use 5G technology to replace all their back-end infrastructure to allow them to run more efficiently. That's exciting, right? So we're using a piece of technology, this future internet, to not only bring you together with your families, but also support very critical processes in the future. So that is one thing I love. The other thing I love, a little bit on the hint side if you are into software, I think the biggest revolution with 5G is, is that it's a complete software system. Okay, so before, I'm not sure how much you're into telecoms. Uh, for telecoms to work, you need a lot of boxes. So if you go on the roof of uh, Cosmo Cache, look on the roof, there's an antenna there. It's being connected to another box and another box. And if you want a new feature, you call up Telefonica, and Telefonica says, no problem, I'll implement the new feature. 10 years later, they come back with a new box, okay? And that new box was called every, every 10 years 2G, 3G, 4G. 5G is different because the boxes are not purpose-made anymore. The boxes are off-the-shelf hardware. You just go to any shop in Barcelona, you buy any server you want, a Dell server, uh, you just uh, write the 5G software on top, and you can innovate much quicker, okay? So and that is something very important. Things which happen in software can be innovated much, much quicker. And 5G will be able to do it, which is why I think 5G will be probably be one of our last Gs, okay? Because you don't hear do you hear a 5G internet? You don't, you don't see actually, you know, Bill, uh, Microsoft, Cisco, and Facebook sit together every 10 years and come up with a new internet. You know, you've never heard of a 4G internet or 5G internet because everybody does stuff uh, in software, totally decoupled with telecoms we're going to get there. Um, what else? Um, let me just move on to some other technology. So we talked a little bit about 5G. Are there any other questions on 5G? If not, we can park them for a moment uh, and we move on to the next tech, okay? Let me talk about... Um, uh, robotics, okay? So robotics is a very exciting field. You will see a lot of stuff actually in Cosmo Kasha here, so I'm not sure how much you've seen the exhibition halls. You will have been exposed quite a little bit to robotics. You will have an intuition what it is all about. I don't want to talk about this. I want to talk about the truly exciting things we're doing currently uh, in the ecosystem. I'm just going to borrow stuff we do at King's. So the first thing we're doing, my, my buddies in an adjacent center, they have invented a robotic system which is entirely soft, okay? So because you think of robots being like very hot stuff where things move and you know, you see that Boston dynamic stuff. So there's like metal, it's metal moving and you're like, ooh, you know, I don't wanna go close to that. So what we did is we totally transformed that and we said, hey, why don't we reproduce something which is more like us? Well, you know, we are not made out of metal. And when we move, you know, it's soft, we're soft human beings. So we invented this entirely soft robotic equipment, no metal in sight, still full control, right? So the future of robotics will probably be a mixture of both. There will be a mixture of hard robotics, which you see down in the exhibition halls, uh, but also soft robotics, uh, where you have the ability to control whatever you want to do in a very flexible manner. Where do we use it? Well, um, one, one very specific example is a medical project we run in China with China Mobile and the Chinese government. So it turns out that the colon cancer detection rate in rural China is very lousy, okay? And it's very lousy not because China doesn't have good doctors. 
it is very lousy because the good doctors want to live in the capitals, right? They want to live in Beijing, and Guangzhou, and Shanghai. In fact, you know, the medical uh, uh, ability in rural areas is very, very poor in general. So it's in Spain like this, in the UK, in China, and India, and the United States. So we thought, hey, why don't we combine our, you know, soft robotic equipment we developed with the ultra low latency 5G stuff I've just shown you, and we beam in the patient into a hospital in Beijing and Shanghai, et cetera, right? So, and that's what we're building now. So the doctor will have a full, uh, full control, full ability, full access to the patient, and they will be able to take the right decisions and save a lot of lives. That's what we're doing with the soft robots. Uh, what else is hot in robotics? What else do we do? Nano robots, right? So it started with MEMS. These are very small devices. You barely see them. These are robots which are very, very tiny, uh, but very powerful. So a device my community built was to use these robots to steer the, 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 the wings of an F-35, so a, a, a fighter jet, right? So the ability to use very small micro devices you don't even see with your bare eye to steer high-end mechanical devices is a real breakthrough. You suddenly see stuff walking around, you don't know where it comes from. Well, these are the MEMS doing this stuff. We are pushing this further. We're doing this now in the nano world. So the idea is to have very small nano robots uh, being injected into your bloodstream and doing whatever they need to do. Right, so one thing we look at is cancer cells, very specific target to cancer cells. These nanorobotic devices would be steered essentially to the specific tumor area. Uh, we would then have them do certain things. We would then release certain medicine. We would have them heat up. We would then uh, do one thing or another, repair the uh, DNA or the RNA. So there's a lot of potential using these type of nanorobots and it's a total transformation. So this is where we're driving at this moment. Um, I think it's a really exciting area. Uh, uh, robotics, but on its own, it's quite useless. You need the connectivity, you need this 5G, uh, and you need um, all the other tech, which I'm going to tell you in a moment. So anything else you want to know about robotics? No, we're good? Yeah? All right. Let's move on to, um, let's move on to AI, okay? Artificial intelligence. Okay. I know where to start with AI. So um, what do you want me to talk about first? The, the good news? or the, uh, the very good news? What do we do? <laughs> very good news, okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, the very good news is that, how do I frame it now? <laughs> you called me that. Uh, so the very good news is that it's a super exciting field, which we actually don't really understand. It's been around for quite a while. It is a very intuitive concept, so I'll not explain you how it works. It's very similar. The AI we have today is very similar to how we work as a human being. There's an input, there's a, something happening in the brain, there's an output, okay? But we have a few problems we don't understand, okay? And we call them conundrums. The first conundrum we have is the conundrum of observation. We talk about AI as if it is something in the future which will impact humanity in five, 10 years, okay? We actually don't know if it hasn't had already a huge impact today. That's one of our big problems. We don't know, okay? You just assume it's a future tech which somehow will impact our kids. And then suddenly we realized, hey, you know what? AI is being used a lot today already. Stock markets, you should know about this, right? On stock markets, we use AI, we're doing trading, whether that is long-term, mid-term, spread, trade, spread, uh, spread trading, et cetera. So there's a lot of stuff used where AI is being used because it's so complex that as a human being, you basically do not manage. So, and here's the thing, right? So an AI engine which has been trained to do something non-violent at all, it's just to maximize profit for the company which uses them, like Kasha as an example, right? And hey, there's another AI engine of Barclays, which has also been trained to do the same thing. And they start to trade against each other. That's what they do, it's natural, they're interacting on the stock market, so that's what they're doing. And suddenly one of the engine realizes, you know what, if I crash one currency and it recuperates, then I have huge financial benefits uh, doing the right thing, right? So suddenly they start essentially crashing the stock market and bringing, lifting it up again because they realize that's helping their gain, essentially, their, their goal of achieving what they need to achieve, right? And we have seen these crashes. There's nothing new. 
If you're in the world, you will know these crashes occurred, and often we don't know why. In fact, the European Union introduced something, I'll tell you later, exactly for that reason. Now, these crashes cause a lot of problems for the nations where the currency is crashed. It causes a lot of friction, causes a lot of conflict, and uh, in some instances, we think it caused war, okay? So therefore, we, had, we started with a very peaceful uh, Bellamy machine, which had nothing else in mind, was trained to do nothing else but to maximize the return on the stock market, right? In this hyper-connected world, it had this butterfly effect that it screwed up other parts of the world. So we realized we actually don't know. We don't know that has happened. We have no evidence. There's no platform of evidence. So we are currently building these platforms of evidence to be able to say AI has caused, uh, is causing, or will be causing these type of problems. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah? All right, so that's really important to notice. Uh, AI is much closer than we think. The other, the other thing which you know, my buddies in Oxford essentially summarize is this uh, paperclip conundrum, okay? So it's very similar to the example I gave you now, but imagine the year 2030, AI is very you know, kind of widespread, really intelligent engines. There's a supercomputer running on this planet, and that very nice supercomputer, um, you know, very peaceful engine has been instructed to provide a paperclip to every single human being because every single human being has a right to have a paper clip and put the paper together, okay? So that's what the machine starts doing. It starts producing these paper clips for the billions of people. <laughs> Halfway through, it realizes there's not enough raw material to give every human being a paper clip. But hey, it's been tasked to do it. So what does it do? Exactly. It gets rid of all the other half of their human beings. It just kills them, all right? Mission accomplished. So I'm, I'm bringing it really to the edge here. It's very clear that you know, situations like, like these will not occur. But in a world which is extraordinarily complex, extraordinarily connected, it may occur. And it may occur as a side result of something you have not thought about. So as chief executives uh, of your future companies, you will be exposed to these problems again and again. Okay, You will be using chatbots what can a chatbot do in terms of harm? Can it cause any psychological stuff to people it talks to? Uh, you're using AI to automate certain things. Is it connected to the wider world? Is it, can it do some harm? Think about these consequences, right? You program it to do one thing, but in a world which is increasingly complex, it can do a lot of other things you have never thought about. You need to think about it, okay? Bear that in mind. Remember these examples. If there's one thing I want you to remember from today, it is my red shoes in these examples, okay? <laughs> Good? All right. Um, so the European Union essentially introduced something uh, which is called the GDPR, and you're very familiar with that. There's one article, though, I'm not sure you paid attention to, is Article 13, which requires that every time a, or any type of machine has been used to take a decision which influences human beings, it needs to be explainable, okay? That is a major issue. All right, it needs to be explainable. Let me give you, so imagine you're using AI in health and uh, your AI engine says, you know, this person should have an operation um, and it has a very profound impact on the system as well as the person, right? So AI essentially now, before there was no problem, you could then base all your decisions, your downstream decision making in the, in the healthcare body. But as of 20, 25th of May 2018 this year, you need to be able to explain why did my AI take this decision? And it is important because a lot of things go wrong. Look at Tesla. Right? You got an accident somewhere, you want to know what's gone wrong. We know it's much better than a human driver, but still we want to understand. The AI frameworks we have today cannot do it. Google DeepMind, all that uh, deep learning stuff cannot do it. It's like as if you have to open up your brain and you have to explain why have you taken a certain decision. You cannot do it. Our current framework, algorithmic framework cannot do it. Okay, so all for all the benefits of AI in Europe, we will always have a human being in between taking the final decision, even if it's just pressing the button. Okay, because that is what you can explain until we come up with a totally new body of artificial intelligence. And that's what we are working on. 
King's College London, we've been doing it for a long time. We call it explainable AI planning. We work with NASA, the Mars Rover mission. We work with the Transport for London. Uh, we work with Schlumberger for remote drilling. So anything what's more industrial, more reliable, where you need to really explain what's happening under your service level agreement, that's a new type of AI we'll be using. So if you're interested in that, you let me know, you drop me an email and I'll send you a link to that uh, because I think the mixture of the AI we're using today and the AI we are constructing at King's will probably be what's going to be running the planet, right? Explainable AI planning for those who are uh, the geeks in the audience, if I may say, okay? Get in touch with me. Uh, what else? So AI, you know, is... Um, uh, overall, I think, you know, it has some really cool features. Probably the one which I like most is that this intuitive, the, the, the degree of intuitive, uh, intuitiveness it has developed. So I'm not sure, have you followed the DeepMind uh, stuff where they were playing against the, the Go, Go player? Have you followed that? So I see some knots here. Anybody else? Have you, do you know what I'm talking about? No, yeah, some of you, so let me just explain that. So, you know, we had different stages of the machines essentially being able to reproduce human thinking uh, and human action taking. And um, it started with IBM uh, beating, you know, the chess player, I, I can't remember, was it uh, Kasparov? So somebody was beaten essentially in chess. Now chess is a game which is has a lot of degrees of freedom. Now, um, now you move on to a next level game which is Go. And Go is a Chinese game, an Asian game, where you have basically an infinite degrees of freedom. So it's endlessly more complicated than chess. And humans have always been better at Go because they had more intuition and no machine was able to beat it. Until, of course, Demis Habibi, my good buddy from DeepMind, comes along and develops AlphaGo, which is able to beat the uh, black belt of Go, right? So the match is played out. Um, I think the machine won four matches and the human won one match, okay? So uh, in essence, the machine has developed a degree of intuition which is scary. But I told them as, you know them as, I think we're still far away from AI taking over at the humans. Because I told them, you know, um, it would have been really scary, really scary, I told them, if your AlphaGo machine would have apologized when it lost the game. Okay, so it not yet doesn't have yet these human traits. Okay, so the guy, the uh, the Korean player, apologized when he lost, but AlphaGo didn't. So we don't yet have these human traits. Okay, so but still, it is a very scary machine, and I've seen stuff. You know, you you don't want to know, um, and maybe that is what uh, we what is maybe the the less good news is we are approaching singularity. It's happening. Okay. So in AI, singularity is the fact where the machine learns quicker than how you, what you teach, okay? So it's learning much quicker than what you teach. So that point of singularity is interesting because we need to see how it goes. If the machine learns quicker, it can do in theory an infinite amount of tasks, uh, what we humans have done until today or will do in the future. So that point of singularity is a bit scary. Um, a lot of people have warned uh, of that point. I'm excited about it. Yeah, I'm not sure how you guys see that, but uh, you know, I think AI can do a lot of great stuff. I think it can, you know, as we say, it can automate your job and it can humanize work because we do a lot of crap the whole day. So if AI can take over and actually help you with this stuff, and so you can focus on what you're best at, being a human, creative human being, that is really where I think you know, AI can make a huge difference. And that's what we're driving, a combination of 5G robotics and AI will allow us this automation of your job in the future, okay? So you don't have to fill in receipts, you don't have to do this, you don't have to set up meetings, it will all be done for you so you can concentrate what you're good at, being with human beings, being creative, uh, you know, being great chief executives and great leaders, right? So take it as an opportunity, but be aware of the threats I told you about, yeah? Any other questions on AI? Okay, good, I love you guys. Okay, <laughs> let's make it you. Yes? Say it again, so the, currently the, uh, so um, Amazon has the shops where they are, you just walk in, you take the goods, you walk out, right? That's the one you mean, yeah? in terms of um, the supermarket. Yeah, oh. the su yeah. Um, but in your opinion, which other appliances you could have uh, in terms of AI with marketing? 
Appliances, you mean like stores or anything else? Yeah, well, other um, modern... Anything. Think of it as a horizontal capability, okay? So what we're doing at the moment, we're building very singular use cases, okay? I think anything where you take a data input in any form, uh, where you need to take any form of decision, and then the important thing is you need to act on that, this is where I really will be transformative, okay? But do not forget that it's all connected. So anything you can think of, whether that is your e-commerce uh, uh, online shop, whether that is, you know, a, a, an on-store shop, um, whether that is, uh, you know, a B2B uh, supply chain type of decision making, you know, anything can be done there. But again, bear in mind what I told you, right? So literally, it's applications. Think of it as a platform capability, nothing else. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so with my MBA, I'm specializing in HR, and I'm actually writing about uh, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. in combination with mm -hmm. HR. Uh, what's your take on the future? You, you can give it your take, but mm -hmm. basically integrating AI together with human resources, yeah. as it is, what yeah. do you think about that? All right, so again, opportunity and actually a real threat in a sense, okay? And I'll talk a, lot, a little bit about this later, but it's very interesting you bring this up because that is probably the point where potentially it's closest where a machine could uh, have a gigantic influence on, on human beings, right? So one easy thing you can think of is you use AI as a psychologist, a much more, un, uh, you know, um, uh, an unbiased psychologist for choosing the right people for the right job, okay? Which I think is a great thing. Uh, the other thing you can do is, particularly in big corporations now, what I, what I look at now with big corporations is to make sure, as we say, you know, there is no wrong skill sets, just the, the wrong person in the wrong place. Place. So figure out this infinite uh, human resources Sudoku where you're essentially having AI trying to figure out who works best together as a team because you know not everybody works well together so you can use AI right there okay but more on the scary side is so there's a company in London uh, which runs entirely on machines okay entirely chief executive uh, chief executive officer chief technology officer chief financial officer all the lawyers everything machines okay so board meetings are rather quick okay so these are microseconds rather than uh, um, so that's the more uh, scary side of it they're trying to make a point so that actually a lot of the uh, chief executive decision making you take are so mundane that machines can take them okay and that's my message back to you guys you know um, you know, I'm chief executive of two companies. And I can tell you I spend a good time of my day doing stuff, which honestly, if I had a machine doing this, I'd be more than happy, right? So I can be creative, okay? I can, I can really do what, what I'm good at. So again, walk the thin line. But I think it's, you know, at this time of the century, it's an opportunity. What's that company called? Which one? The, the machine company. I can't remember. I'll find it out. I'll, I'll send it to Anna. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Okay, so that's a question on the uh, basic uh, universal income. So that's a good question. Um, how do I answer that? Uh, you know, we, we run experiments. Uh, how, do I, how do I answer that? Let me tell you a story. Uh, Heinrich Böll. I'm not sure you know Heinrich Böll. So he's a, he's a German author who's a, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in literature. And he wrote a beautiful story. It's about a, a fisherman lying on the beach and, you know, just chilling out in the boat. And then one of the business guys who happens to be in the island comes in and asks for fire and they start chatting, okay? And it's asking, the business guy asks the fisherman, why, why do you, why in your boat? You could be out fishing. Um, and, you know, and he said, why should I do it? And he said, well, if you go out fishing, you know, you catch fish, you sell, you get money, you buy more boats, uh, then you sell more fish. You then can actually get a whole factory and you can get really going, you know, you can build a huge empire and then you can actually lay down and, oh, and then he said, oh, wow, yeah, you're doing this actually, you're relaxing. I said, exactly, right? So interestingly, so the essence of the story is interesting that notion of work, that we are human beings only if we work, has been introduced by Karl Marx not too long ago, okay? Before that, uh, only 30% of humanity was maintaining the other 70%, okay? So I'm not saying we should go back to this, but I'm just saying that it might be worth resetting uh, our relationship to work because we're working 24-7, uh, often more than five days a, days a week. Um, so use that as an opportunity to essentially have people work less, uh, more intense, more creatively, 
Um, and then whatever comes out of the efficiency, we need to see how this needs to be distributed. Is taxing robots and machine the right way? Maybe, we can do it, we can think about it later when I tell you the, uh, the, uh, the mechanisms we have today. I was thinking about this, so is a universal income where you essentially any company which uses AI uh, would essentially pay in a pot and then that pot's being used to pay people who have no job in, in, as a result of that? Maybe, but you know, humanity has always been very creative. We introduced one platform of innovation and suddenly loads of new doors opened up, right? So something old will die, there's no doubt about this. And uh, you know, you're probably in a cusp of a massive change, um, but you know, you will have new, new opportunities. So I'm, I, I don't think you have the right answer for that, but wealth, the, the distribution of wealth in our relationship to work will need to be re rethought. Yeah, does that make sense what I'm saying? Okay, good, yes. So, based on the various technologies that you mentioned, um, there's artificial intelligence and there's actually a lot of buzz about it in the general public. But the nanorobotics that you mentioned, I think is not that talked about. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know where is the progress in that field as of today? Okay, so nano, good question. The nanorobots today, so we're able to uh, to actually manufacture them, which is already a good thing. And once you zoom in, <clears throat> so they don't look like real robots, okay, but they have an ability to be uh, guided. So what we do today is we are loading uh, magnetic material onto these little robots because we want them to go through the bloodstream in the opposite directions if it needs to be. So we would have an external magnetic field which would steer essentially the, the body of that nano, nano robot through the blood. And then we do have a small, we call them charges or loads, so they carry something. It could be a bigger metallic bowl. So what for instance we did, one of the first things we did is we brought a lot of that nano stuff into a specific cancer region, then you would use a microwave uh, frequency to heat up uh, only the metal. The metal reacts much more to the microwave radiation than uh, your, 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 your cells and your water. So therefore that, that metal becomes super hot and burns out the cancer from inside whilst leaving all the cells intact, right? But the principle's always the same. So you have a body which you can control and steer. And currently the only methodology we have meaningful is with an external magnetic field. And then we have a payload which delivers medicine or anything else, right? It's moving, it's coming really, really quickly, yeah. Yeah, okay. More questions? I don't know where the microphone is. You just talk, you know, whoever has a microphone, yeah. Hi. Uh, in terms of the soft robots you talked about, um, will it be like the movie with I Smith's iRobots? It is like life assistance? And how, uh, what is the progress right now? Is it still in the beginnings or there's still a lot to go? Will it be like life assistance, helping help uh, yeah. old people yeah. or? Yeah. or? We, we are there. I mean, it's Already? there, yeah, yeah, yeah. So particularly a life assistant, which is a functional robot, so it doesn't have to be super sexy and look like us in a sense, right. or behave like us. So if you look at Japan and you know, in the United States, you have a lot of these robots which help already uh, patients either as an external or you actually mount exoskeletons, right? So we have right, that, yeah. it's up and running. But uh, I think the more interesting thing is the Boston Dynamics stuff. So if well, you look down- That's scary. Yeah, that's scary, <laughs> I agree, I agree. I agree. So you know that you got a video down there from Boston Dynamics on the uh, on the screen in Lakasha. They have just released another one. So there's a, a, there's something which looks like a human being, and it jumps. It jumps yeah, like yeah, yeah. you know it's, parkour. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. And I have oh. another question. Is it um, do you integrate the four laws of uh, the robotics in the the? Is it still there? I mean, is it concrete? Because we see this in movies, and it, yeah. the four laws do exist, yeah. and you can integrate integrate yeah. it into AI or. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can do, so anything where you need to integrate machine with machine is being done, right? So right. we have today robots connected to 5G, and I'll show you later maybe something. Uh, we have AI integrated. Um, you know, if you let me, give me enough time, I can talk about blockchain a little bit. Uh, we have other tech implemented. The problem is not the technology with the technology. The problem is a human in a chain, because often you need to embed these into a process where humans are involved. There's a manager who needs to make a decision uh, and stuff like this. So therefore, 
you know, I think Amazon is a good example. Their strategy, whether you like it or not, was to create warehouse where you don't have humans there at all, right? So nobody is interfering in a sense. It's just machines running with machines. And once you have that, it's much easier to do. But again, the ethical implications, I'm not taking any side of that. Um, but I'm just telling you that the, uh, the coexistence human machine is the biggest challenge today. Yeah? Got it. All right. Okay, uh, shall we move on? Um, or? Michelle, I, I, sorry, I'm here. Oh, hey. <laughs> sorry. How are you, buddy? Uh, good. Okay. Um, thanks for coming over uh, today morning. Uh, I just uh, was thinking, with AI uh, getting into each and every aspect of the human world, and now with news coming in that AI creating another AI, mm. right, and all of that happening, how do you see the legal and ethical uh, mm. aspects of mm. this entire thing? If, if tomorrow an AI created an AI and that AI made an error and mm. somebody dies, mm. how does the le legal mm. infrastructure or the framework work? Mm. We don't know. The answer is it's, it's so ultra complex and we have no good answer for that. What we are thinking now, in fact, what, you know, literally my community, myself, we're thinking is to make sure that at least we're able to monitor and absorb and, and, and uh, um, yeah, monitor what AI is doing, right? This platform of observation, which we don't know because people throw AI out there, it's doing things. We need this urgently. And what I'm talking about specifically is whenever you have an artificial intelligence engine somewhere doing something, each of the states inside or the input uh, and or the output should be recorded on some form of accessible uh, database. Okay, at least we create that knowledge. So we can start to see what is each engine is doing, what's the uh, first order, second order, third order impact we're doing. So our biggest concern now is to create this platform of observation. Okay, and once we have done that, then we can start thinking of, you know, how do you control, how do you monitor it, how do you control it, what type of ethical laws do you put in? European Union got out of this with Article 13 saying, you know what, you need to explain it. Well, nobody can explain it, so there's still always a human in between taking the final decision for the time being. Yeah, that's a good question. So Tesla is a good example. If an accident happens, who's, who, who's faulty, right? So, yeah. Okay, shall we? Okay, um, uh, one question more and then I move on, okay? Unless, you know, are you interested in blockchain? Do you want me to explain a bit about blockchain? Yeah? Okay. Okay, uh, hi. We'll uh, take yours as well, yeah. Uh, I'm from Egypt, so I'm a our country is still developing and infrastructure and connectivity is a big issue. So will AI and 5G have an impact and will make the country better or will AI and 5G make good countries better and weak countries worse mm -hmm. or are more outdated? Mm -hmm. That's a difficult one. That's a very good question. Um, you know, I work a lot with, so I don't work with Egypt, but I work a lot with African countries. I work a lot in the APAC region, South America. Um, it all depends in the end of the day on your politicians and on your politicians and your political ecosystem and the and, and, and entrepreneurial ecosystem, right? But there's an opportunity to jump generations, okay? Look at Colombia. So I work a lot with Colombia. So Colombia now is probably one of the most advanced digital countries in South America because they had a really great leadership, good ministers, and they managed to jump a lot of the, uh, you know, the generations which we in Europe had to go through in the US, which is a pain. You know, you go through a lot of le legacy stuff. So you want to introduce 5G. Oh, you can't because there's 4G still and 3G and 2G. And a lot of these countries now have the opportunity to jump this straight ahead. So depending on if, if if the government is ready to do that, then I think, you know, sky's the limit because now there's a lot of really interesting stuff coming up. Um, but of course, it really depends on, on the country's leadership. So you, you need to see. I, I don't know Egypt much, to be honest. So what, what's your feel? Are you going to do it? No? Got it. Okay. Let, let, me, let me get that sorted. Okay. Uh, you had one question. Yeah. One last question and then we move on. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned earlier about an AI singularity, and I'm sort of wondering what the consensus is among experts and things like this. Mm. How do you personally uh, imagine that kind of a future? Mm. And does it also scare you? Like, do you also feel like it's going to be sort of I, like something from a dream, you know, like that it's extra dimensional, that you know, it's going to develop so far that... Mm. You know, in fact, machines will figure out the universe and not us. And once we mm. develop a program or a, a thing like this, 
that it, it would just take off, you know, and it would leave us behind. Mm. So I, I'm wondering, how do you personally envision does it, it? Does it does it scare me? I don't know. Do you want the, my honest answer or a diplomatic one? No, I want I want the, I want to know if it keeps you up at night. If you're worried about it, or you know, it if you scares, can't sleep it because the of it. Shit out of me. That's okay. right. Yeah. Excuse my plain English, right? So, um, yeah, it is. It is scary. And I've seen stuff now, you know, which isn't isn't in the public domain, which is really scary. Uh, with Demis, so the chief executive of DeepMind, you know, we had we had so many discussions. So, look, the the good news is so far is that I think machine, and that's what I've been arguing with Demis, is that you know AI currently can only visualize. Um, Whereas we as humans, we can imagine, okay? So would a machine today being able to come up with a Picasso? Ima imagine there was no Picasso before, right? A Picasso, the answer is no. Would it come up with a, a Beethoven or a Mozart uh, without these, this body before? The answer is no. Now with all these Picassos and Mozart around, you just put it into a big engine, it, it's doing superimposition, and it comes up with something which looks like Mozart, it looks like uh, Picasso, etc. So therefore, it can only superimpose currently prior human knowledge, which is gigantic, but it's not infinite, okay? It becomes really scary when AI will be able to truly imagine, okay? Not only visualize, but actually truly imagine. Um, are we able to do that today? The answer is no. Are we trying to do it? The answer is yes. Do I think I know how to do it? The answer is yes as well. So, um, and I give you a little hint, I think quantum technology will play a huge role in that, okay? So here you go. So I'm not sure whether we are opening up exciting new opportunities or whether we are digging our own grave. Anyway, please do not come hunting after me uh, in 20 years time. But yeah, it's a good question. So it keeps me up. It literally keeps me up, yeah, all right. Um, uh, okay, but let's let's remember also the opportunities. Okay, so and let's take step by step. I don't want to scare you off. Uh, we have a lot of people worried. Uh, we have a lot of very good people worried. So we, we hopefully we can take care of that. Okay, so let's move on. I have 15 minutes left, and I haven't even gone to 10% of my presentation. Okay, all right. So what do we do? Uh, let's go on. Do you want to know about blockchain a bit? Yeah. Okay. So any any uh, uh, Bitcoin millionaires in the room here? All right. Good stuff. All right, so you know you will know this stuff. Um, okay, so what what we're gonna do is <laughs> now you're all wondering, you know, who's that Bitcoin millionaire in the room? We didn't know. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, all right, so the um, uh, blockchain. Look, I mean. It's, it belongs to the uh, family of what we call distributed ledger technology. Now, a ledger, it's very simple, right? So it's a bit overhyped. So let me just explain you what it is. Uh, a ledger in English is literally just a book. You remember these uh, church books, these huge books uh, where you kept like names in there, who was born, when, and the, okay? That's a ledger, right? So that's what we do. So today, these ledgers, of course, are not big books. Uh, they're electronic, okay? So each page contains a certain content. Let's say, you know, I want to write down that I have done business with Anna. Where's Anna? Anna is somewhere in the room. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying, you know, Anna, I pay you $10,000 uh, on, you know, 23rd of October 2018. It goes on this piece of paper, okay? Now, normally you would, on these type of transactions, you would bring it to a bank. But, you know, we want to stop trusting these centralized entities. We actually want to see if we can do something which works in a non-centralized way. So what we're doing now is, is we are actually saying, hey, you know, with this single page which says, you know, I gave uh, Anna $10,000 on the 23rd of October 2010, we are going to distribute it among as many people as we can, okay? So um, that's what we're going to do. Each of you gets it. So uh, most of you don't know uh, each other in theory, so there's a good degree of non-correlation in here. So you keep these entries. Now, if I asked you right now, uh, you know, would, would you take this digital entry if I paid you one Bitcoin? Hands up, who would do it? Okay, so if I paid you one Bitcoin right now to take that ledger information, which I just said, $10,000. A Bitcoin's a lot of money now, by the way. So hands up, who would do it? Okay, so that's what you find. Everybody would do it, okay? Because it's easy money, just store some digital record. Um, What's the point? Because you could very quickly ask your friends to keep all that information, etc. So, you know, there's not really a lot of trust in that. But let me rephrase that uh, question. Um, I have run you a marathon of 42 kilometers, and then I'll give you the distributed ledger, uh, the ledger entry. Who would do it now? 
You see what I mean? It's become much more one person, right? So it's become much more difficult. So we attach essentially the, uh, you know, the act of storing a certain amount of information to a certain work, okay? We've, we're doing work for this. So then not everybody wanted, wants to do this anymore, okay? And in the digital world, of course, we don't have you run the marathon. Uh, in the initial worlds, uh, you know, in the, in the initial days, we had you solve very difficult cryptographic problems, which is called mining. In fact, you have to do something very specific. And that's what we do. Everybody, loads of people, independent people, start working like crazy. Uh, they mine the stuff, they found a solution, and the first one who found the solution to the problem is allowed to claim the Bitcoin, and that person is the first one to keep that ledger entry. Okay, and then everybody else who participated gets a copy of that. So we essentially uh, increase the barrier of entry of being part of that game. Um, what else did we introduce there? We introduced essentially the ability uh, to link each page with each other. So today in a physical ledger, you know, you have pages. You rip one page out, nobody would notice. If you do it really well, nobody notices. Yeah, you can literally get rid of certain uh, act, uh, track records which happened in the 18th century, no problem. Uh, you could also uh, start modifying it. If you're very good in writing, you could just modify that, right? So what we said is, uh, hey, you know what? Let's link each page to the previous page. So we're introducing a certain number on each of these digital ledgers, which is what we call a hash function of your current page as well as all the pages before, right? So we're creating something which chains the pages to each other. If you rip out one page, you know, everyone would suddenly realize, hey, you know, something is wrong here. My chain suddenly breaks. These numbers don't add up anymore, okay? And because we have distributed that, if you really wanted to get rid of a certain entry, you would need to go to every single person who has that ledger and ask them to rip out that specific uh, page, right? And it becomes virtually impossible to change that entry. So it becomes what we call immutable, okay? So by distributing my pages, by uh, introducing memory into these pages, okay, and that uh, we're creating these blocks, the chain in the block, we are creating now a ledger which is immutable. And that's very interesting because suddenly you can store a lot of information on there which uh, you may want to have forever and transparently available, okay? So Bitcoin is one example. It uh, bases on the so-called proof of work where you actually work on this. Today we do it differently. We don't have you work anymore. We work on proof of stake. So if you have somebody who is somebody who has a lot of stake in a specific, Ethereum is like this. If you have a lot of uh, ethos, you have a lot of ch uh, stake in that specific chain. You don't want this to be uh, hijacked. You don't want the chain to be abused. So you're a person, if you have a lot of ethos, a lot of coins in the Ethereum chain, you have a lot of stake in this chain. So we trust you. So therefore, you are able to take certain decisions and, and say this is a true transaction or not, okay? So this is how we're doing it. We're moving now on. Um, we have a new system, which is completely DApp system for those, uh, you know, the geeks in the room. Um, EOS, have you heard of EOS? Anybody heard of EOS? Yeah, of course, no doubt. So Brandon from Block One is a good buddy of mine. So they're the guys who had the world's largest ICO, right? Four billion dollars uh, initial coin offering, quite phenomenal. So blockchain, essentially, the only thing I want you to remember is, is it's really a simple technology. It's literally digital pages which are linked to each other, which are distributed, and you store certain amount, a certain amount of uh, information on there, like you know, like you would have your bank, a bank receipt, etc. Some of that can be encrypted. Some of that can be, you know. You can, you can make it in clear as ever you like. Now, you want to link that to AI as an example, right? So, for instance, AI is taking a certain decision. You want to have a blockchain immediately record all the decisions taken. And then nobody is able to alter that anymore. So in the year 2030, I can look back what my engine in 2018 did, and I can learn from that, right? So if somebody wants to hide something, it's virtually impossible. That's the power of blockchain, yeah? Um, what else? Um, then quantum very quickly. Uh, so quantum technology is something you probably think, hey, what's he talking about? It's coming, okay? So quantum means a quantum computer can do things much faster than my current computer. So my current computers are very quick, but they work linearly, just manipulating ones and zeros, okay? Um, so if you need to optimize a problem, some problems are just not tractable. A quantum computer can do that in a much shorter time. So here's the threat, because it can crack security very quickly, 
Okay, that's a real problem. That keeps me up at night as well. So we are looking currently at new security protocols which allow us to be, the systems to be resistant to quantum attacks. And it, uh, the opportunity though is you can do things much, much quicker, okay? So I want you to remember these. I want you to remember that this is what we have today. Let me see if the laser works. Uh, we have our AI. It needs, to be, uh, it needs to execute certain stuff. It needs to be connected. Uh, it needs to solve very intractable problems because the AI is very complicated and you want to create a, a ledger of what you have done, okay? A degree of accountability. This will be your tech ecosystem uh, of the companies you're going to be chief executing, okay? There will be more. More stuff comes up, but these are the basics we have built up. So what do we do now? Um, we're putting things together as emerging systems. I just want to talk you through some exciting stuff I'm doing. So the guy uh, you see here is, not this guy, the guy before, is uh, a Peter Galt. So he's number two uh, DJ in the world after Dead Mouse. So I'm not sure, are you, are you clubbing a lot? Do you know Dead Mouse? Who knows Dead Mouse? All right, good, good stuff. Thanks God, you know. Oof. Okay, uh, normally the audiences I talk to, nobody knows what I'm talking about. At least you know what I'm talking about. So um, Peter Gall is number two, arguably. So he's DJing in Avalon, Los Angeles. And uh, we connected him through a hologram into a club in West Hollywood where you know, a crowd was dancing as well. Now, and then we connected him all the way back into his club where he was DJing so he could see both crowds, his Avalon crowd as well as the crowd in, in, uh, in, the, um, in the West Hollywood club. Um, and he was adapting the music. So, and then I realized, you know, actually what we're doing is we're doing, we're going well beyond augmented reality or virtual reality. We're actually building something which brings environments together. We're synchronizing realities. So I gave it a new, new term. And I think the future will really be synchronized reality. With 5G ultra low latency, you can bring, you know, environments together using synchronized uh, reality technology. So that's one of the new concepts I think is emerging. And, uh, um, uh, the other one is on the Internet of Skills, so that is my dream, my baby really. I'm building the next generation internet. We had the fixed internet connecting all the computers on planet Earth. We had the mobile internet connecting all mobile phones. We now have the things internet connecting internet of things. What's next? Well, I think the next big thing is to transmit skills, to transmit touch, to transmit muscle movement. We can do it now. I just talked you through robotics. I talked you through 5G. I talked you through AI. We can transmit physical skills today. I can teach anybody in the world how to play the piano, People can teach me how to paint. Uh, we can maintain engines. We can do so many things now transmitting skills through the internet, right? You just put three or four of the emerging techs together and you have an internet of skills, right? So we're building this now. And I think it's an exciting opportunity to transit from a world which we call Industry 4.0. We have loads of robots working in a manufacturing hall and, you know, doing things to a world which I call human 4.0. So rather than empowering machines, hey, let's use the technology to empower uh, human beings. You, okay? So if you're good in something, use it, teach it, make some good in the world. And we're building these systems now, okay? So this internet of skills is currently coming up. So you will remember that day, please, 23rd of October 2018. I told you about this new exciting internet, okay? Um, not sure it makes sense now for me to go to section three. Um, I can leave you, or you can invite me again, okay? We just talk through essentially all these business recommendations I have working with big companies like Schlumberger, uh, Verizon, um, uh, British Gas, etc. Shall we do that? We skip that part now and uh, we take more questions in the panel. Shall we do it? I'm looking at the organizers. I'm flexible. I can talk for hours, yeah? It's a, what do you want to do? You want me to continue? You want to... Two minutes? I can't do anything in two minutes. <laughs> oh, you want to, any other questions in the room? Oh, yeah. All right. You know your audience well. Okay. So there's another section here is where you need to organize us to ask them to invite me again. Okay. Because I think it's actually quite exciting. Um, but let's take questions right now. So there's a question down there. Yeah. So I have two questions in regard to cryptocurrency. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat myself. So I have two questions in regard to cryptocurrency and blockchain. Uh, my first question, I guess, as an expert, you believe in, in cryptocurrency? Is that, is that my... Oh, dear. Am I right in that thinking? That. 
<laughs> so I guess my question in, in regard to that is what cryptocurrencies do you believe in? Okay. Which one should, should we right. uh, as investors invest in? Because <laughs> that's important to me because I'm invested in about 15 to 20 okay. Okay. different cryptocurrencies. <laughs> All right, so I, I think it's an interesting notion. You, you should ask, uh, you know, your buddy who's, who's, who's made a good fortune. You're that, you're right. Um, I'll introduce you later because I'm not sure you know each other. So the, um, um, I think it's a great notion. I mean, Bitcoin is, is very, you know, the, the, the currencies we have currently are very different to the currency I have in my pocket because the currency I have in my pocket is bound to some real labor. I have done something, I have produced something, I have a service to sell. That's our currency to do it, and you understand it much better than I do. Um, whereas Bitcoin, interestingly, is something which is currently not bound to any work except the mining work, which is something I think we should get rid of very quickly because it consumes a lot of energy. Right? That was my second question yeah. in regard to energy. Yeah, so it's a real problem. It's a real problem, which is why we migrate now to the proof of stake, because you don't need to do the mining anymore. It becomes a totally different exercise, okay? Um, however, so, but Bitcoin, there's so much money now invested. It's a bit like gold, right? So gold is, uh, it's, there's no work related to gold, but it is a heaven. It is maintained because people have invested. It's being traded, etc. right? So in Bitcoin is now in this stage. We had a little drop in... Uh, in January, uh, December last year, where essentially some of the big funds who have been speculating withdrew a lot of money, but I think it has stabilized now. So I don't think it will drop anymore. I might be wrong, but uh, I think it's a, it's a good currency to, to, to do stuff. I'm not sure it's good enough to park things, okay? But the other, there are other currencies emerging which are actually related to very specific services and goods, okay? So if you want to trade, for instance, your data plans or you want to trade a certain uh, stuff you build, I work now with a lot of artists, they want to sell their art in that. So then that becomes a currency which is bound to something real and then it becomes interesting, right? So look out for these currencies which are not hollow as I call them, which are real. Bitcoin is hollow but seems to be stable enough, okay? But the rest, uh, I'm not sure how long it will survive. Right. Is that a good answer? You know, my Bitcoin, uh, is that a good answer? Yeah, maybe you can answer that. You, you, can you give him a microphone, please? Yeah, yeah. Oh, we may have asked the Bitcoin millionaire, right? So. <laughs> the millionaire, please. Uh, if I uh, follow what you're saying, so about the proof of stake and everything, I will say you to take a look at this year Dequel. Like, that's my uh, favorite currency in the market. And... Um, they, they focus on community input. So for example, if you, uh, if you code and everything, you can just go on their platform on GitHub and uh, code with them and help them to write the, the code we need, you know? You know what I mean? GitHub? You know what we're talking about? You have seen it, right? Yeah. I think you need to talk less technical. So I think he just wants to know the currency. The, the, DCR. Yeah? DCR. DCR. It's the shit. Got it? <laughs> right? Everybody buying now and you selling. <laughs> Good stuff, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, yes. is it okay if I... <clears throat> Sorry, can I take the lady first and yeah, then sure. wherever you are, yeah. So I have a question on blockchain mm -hmm. and AI. So earlier you mentioned about the AI chat box. I want to understand, does it work on the blockchain, uh, the chat box? Uh, sorry, how how you how can you combine the chat box yeah, and and the blockchain? Yes. Yeah. So I think a, a very interesting project here would be to, um, well, first of all, to record all the kind of uh, output the chatbot has produced, right? So, and uh, again, I think that's very important because you want to keep a a record which ideally is public for people to essentially start learning from that record, right? So any combination AI and blockchain is very interesting and has not been explored at all uh, because you need a lot of data to learn. For your AI to work properly, you need a lot of data. And anybody in the room who's running an AI business will know this. That's the biggest bottleneck. So the actual algorithms is open source. You find a lot of people who know how to use it. How do you get the data? So if you can have a, a public ledger a blockchain where a lot of that data insights, par parameters, configurations are stored on the legend, you can just take it and configure your own machines like that, then that would be, I think, a great uh, benefit to, to humanity in general, right? So it's a, it's a great roadmap to go down. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question? Yeah. One more question, go ahead. 
Uh, well, I conducted an ICO last summer. So you said that your friend did a four billion dollar mm -hmm. ICO. Yeah. It's technically a two-parter. Did he make the money in the pre-sale stage or in the crowd sale stage? So he was very smart. They did a rolling ICO. Okay. So they so they raised a lot in pre-sales. Uh, in fact, from buddies of mine like uh, Peter Thiel and uh, Christian Angamai, who billionaires on their own. So they raised a lot of cash up front to get all the firepower to get essentially to the public ICO, but they had no closing date. And I'm not even sure they yet closed the ICO. Um, and in fact, one thing really interesting, peculiar is we don't know how much money they self-injected into the system. So we don't actually know how much of the four billion are true independent money, okay? All right, and just to follow up, do you still believe in ICOs? Because in the cur like currently, the environment over there is mm -hmm. uh, 2016 was the ICO year, 2017, 18 is the year of ICO conventions kind of thing. Yeah, so I, you know, I'm doing one actually. So the, um, I believe in them, but as long as there's something real attached, like, a, like you would expect from an IPO, right? So we have gone beyond the hype years now. So unless you find somebody really dumb, uh, you know, you cannot have an ICO anymore on something which is just a pipe dream. So I think all the ICO, if you have a real product, which is really interesting, okay, and you have a, a coinomics attached to that where you really need uh, a, a new coin to actually make your product work, uh, do the ICO, go for it. All right, so maybe you will not get to 4 billion, maybe you will not even get to 100 million. But you know, if you get to 10 million, it's, it's cash, right? You can get things off the ground. So, but make it real, right? Thank you. Okay, make it real. Let's leave it with that. Yeah, all right. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Good questions. Okay, wow. Um, the possi possibilities seem endless, so let's move on now. Um, you now have the opportunity to hear a real-life business example of how artificial intelligence is pushing companies forward and creating competitive advantage. With 23 years of experience in the IT sector, Mr. Jaume Porte is co-founder and CEO of Bia Blue, a company created in 2008 which uses artificial intelligence to create new experiences for consumers with clients such as Walmart, Inditex, and IKEA. Moreover, Beer Blue is one of the very few countries, companies in Europe to be included in Go the Goldman Sachs report as a company which will determine the retail and trade of the future. So, so that we can see how Beer Blue is using artificial intelligence to shape retail, please join me in welcoming Jaume to the stage. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for hosting me here today. Uh, we will be uh, sharing a little bit of insights of how we are using artificial intelligence to improve the customer experience in retail shops uh, around the world. There's a big hype on retail. Uh, retail is in deep transformation at the moment. And uh, it's very interesting to see how artificial intelligence is helping both online and offline players. Uh, I, we will be sharing a little bit about that and how we see this uh, evolving in, in the near future. So the first we would like to uh, show you is a small video we prepared uh, a couple of years ago to share with our team and our partners how we were going to uh, embrace the, this, this challenge uh, of bringing artificial intelligence into the retail world. And, and then we'll, we'll get into the real products and how we are uh, making this happen uh, nowadays with our customers. So let's start with that. A new era in technology is here. Artificial intelligence is not any longer something of futuristic dreams. It's becoming a reality and fast. This growth is set to continue. Artificial intelligence technologies and their impact are endless. High-tech corporations are investing heavily in these technologies. Deep learning or machine learning platforms are examples of that. From the outset, the Blue has been working in developing solutions that includes uh, virtual agents, uh, digital neurosystems, and other uh, artificial intelligence technology. To us, artificial intelligence is part of uh, our natural evolution. 
At Diablo, a lot of people from different places and backgrounds come together to take the artificial intelligence technologies to their limits and beyond. By improving the customer journey using these technologies, we can take a step forward and make sure that we have a better quality of life for our customers. We believe that it's time for retailers to reach out and help consumers to find the products when they need them. Or even before they realize they need them, whether they are in the online or on the physical world. By collecting data and building dashboards, uh, which measure essential KPIs, we help retailers to learn you know, what matters the most to their consumers and to take appropriate actions to address their needs and exceed their expectations. Diablo Artificial Intelligence allows brands and consumers to establish a one-to-one -one relationship to talk directly and frankly, helping them to announce customer experience and service level. Beyond the mere hype, artificial intelligence is set to rethink the rules of engagement, just like smartphone and PC technologies did in the past. It's going to be an exciting journey that combines people, passion and technology and we cannot think of better ingredients. So that was almost two years ago and we started with uh, a journey to try to bring artificial intelligence into uh, real spaces, physical spaces, to make them smarter and to serve them customers better. And we started by reflecting on how is the uh, how retailers and brands are reaching out to consumers nowadays. And, and we realize that uh, basically uh, brands are trying to reach out to all of us uh, using all, to all sorts of media. No? They start with uh, newspapers, uh, uh, with some sort of you know, branding of newspapers or, or uh, social media advertising. Then we walk on the street and we keep seeing the same images and the same content and we start, you know, getting a sense of it, and then at some point, uh, we jump into the physical world. Oops, sorry. There we go. So we jump into the physical world, and then we end up recognizing those brands or those products in, in the stores uh, where we, we can actually experience them. Or we end up just you know, deciding to click on one of those banners and jumping into the e-commerce world. And we do that, you know, both in the online or in the offline world. We might go to the shop and end up buying online or vice versa. Uh, so this is happening. Uh, experience are, uh, experiences are omnichannel. And uh, retailers are trying to, you know, embrace all those opportunities. But making sense out of it is more challenging than what it seems. Actually, uh, Goldman Sachs did a deep report on, on this one year ago, and they, they realized that um, basically there's two big crises at the moment in the retail world. One is traditional retailers have seen their conversion to sales uh, going down, uh, their traffic to their stores going down too, but moreover, the, the conversion from visits to purchases uh, was, not, uh, was not as before. But at the same time, uh, e-commerce retailers have uh, started to see uh, that their growth is slowing down. And that sounds a little weird in Europe or US, where the growth is 20% or 30% a year. But uh, what's happening already in China is that e-commerce in the last two quarters uh, has started to, to be flat. And that is a big thing, because that means that all the key players of e-commerce world, like Alibaba, Tenzin, and all the other guys with a lot of cash in their bank accounts needs to do something else, needs to create, keep creating value for their shareholders doing something else. And if you would see the investments they've been doing in the last few years, you would see how they've been already um, pre uh, predicting this to happen and they've been investing heavily in traditional retail. They own 35% uh, of Ocean or they, they own RT Mart or they own, you know, they own uh, big stakes on traditional retailers. And the reason why they, they've been doing this is not because they don't believe in e-commerce, is that because they understand the real nature of e-commerce. E-commerce is there to help us doing convenience purchases. 
but it's not there to help us uh, improving our experience in, uh, with products. Uh, we've been evolving as human beings for millions of years. We love to use our nose, our hands, uh, our eyes to understand the world. And we are way more this than uh, a guy looking at the uh, digital representation of something. So, so that's why we prefer to buy in the physical world. We prefer, prefer to sense with our senses what we're going to buy and understand the whole context of what we are purchasing. And that's why um, the, the, the future of, of retail is not you know, e-commerce eating more and more of the cake. Is e-commerce eating up to 20% of the cake and the rest of it, 80% of it, uh, according to the Jack Ma and other experts on, on this world, is going, going to stay in the traditional retail. But how is the traditional retail going to evolve? And that's, that's the question that Goldman Sachs was, was trying to answer. And basically, um, the, the, what they say is um, the, the technology is there to help improving and delivering an amazing customer experience in the retail shore, uh, stores. But how? Uh, basically using the best of the latest technologies to understand what customer wants and to react to it in a dynamic way. We can see here a, a small picture of the key technologies that Goldman Sachs identified as crucial for the future of, uh, of retail and to create those amazing experiences in the, in the retail spaces. And we can see how machine learning Facial recognition, robotics, RFID are there. Machine learning to you know, really understand the DNA of what customers want and what they do. Uh, facial detection to understand what customers look at and how they interact with physical world. Robotics to react automatically to it. RFID is a small little chip that goes integrated into products so that we can know how they move around the store and we can understand how customers interact with them. Uh, employee management and clienteling is software to make sense out of you know, the management of staff or, or customer relationship, but then as smart shelves that react how, on how we uh, interact with products on them or develop uh, you know, uh, customized pricing for each uh, of the customers visiting the store. Then wireless connectivity to give you guys uh, connection when, when you visit stores. And finally, uh, business in intelligence solutions that bring, um, you know, make sense out of the censoring of the store. And a uh, small gap there, but very important, artificial intelligence to organize this whole ecosystem uh, with uh, an artificial intelligence uh, uh, capabilities. No? So in this, in this uh, ecosystem, we can find companies like uh, Google or Microsoft, Intel, IBM. And one of the companies that was um, identified by Goldman Sachs in this ecosystem was us. And basically, because of the way we use artificial intelligence to communicate smart in the retail space. And, and what we do with that artificial intelligence is basically help sales uh, going up to 17% uh, uh, and improve advertising efficiency 350%. And uh, that basically means delivering better customer experience to customers in the stores. The way we do this is uh, we take control of the digital signage systems uh, in the retail spaces. So um, the screens that you can see in the stores, uh, they are not just a video loop showing content. They are, uh, they are observing what happens around them. So our software is controlling those digital signage systems. And with a small camera integrated on it, we're observing customers and we're trying to understand what they want and what they do. Uh, so the first thing that we do is analyze faces and we analyze if they are men or women, uh, their gender and their attention span to each content that's uh, available in the store. So we, in, in digital signage systems, we're changing the content every 10 seconds, every 15 seconds. So we are seeing how much each of those contents is getting and capturing the attention span of every human being passing by. But we also observe uh, customer attention to product walls or to shop windows so that we can understand if they really like you know, that type of shoes or those jackets or those uh, uh, shirts uh, in, in, in a certain section. And we can learn from it. So the store is not only you know, observing, but it's also learning from it so that it can automatically react to it 
uh, on the next turn. And here we can see how this store is showing different content based on um, the detection in real time of a man or a woman passing by. And those are things that the store learned by itself by doing artificial intelligence uh, analysis of data and how that data correlate, correlates to sales, which is actually what people go to stores to do. Uh, they go to, to, to stores to do that, and, and it's their best expression of satisfaction in a retail space. So we correlate sales with uh, eyeballs and attra uh, attra attraction, attraction uh, rate of each advertising campaign in the store so that we can make the store react automatically to the customer presence. We also sense customer behavior by observing their movements. We do this with zenithal cameras that see how they move, but we also observe customers' movements by uh, observing their mobile phones. So we see mobile phones' heartbeats passing by in front of the stores. We see how they walk in, and we can triangulate the signal and understand where customers are going in the physical space and how long they are staying in every single area. With this, we again learn what they like and what they want. Uh, and we also analyze uh, if they connect to uh, the Wi-Fi network, we analyze what they do with that Wi-Fi connection, uh, meaning not that they are per any personal data, but what we see is if they connect to Facebook, if the connections go to Google, if the connections go to the website of this store, or if the connections go to Amazon, so that we can understand uh, you know, a good uh, picture of how to reach out to them or what are they missing from our value proposition in that retail space. Another thing we, we do is uh, we allow the mobile phones and their applications to talk to the space. So you have a mobile application in your pocket. It's the, you know, from one brand or one retail owner. You walk in one of the stores. Uh, if you have that mobile application, that mobile application can give us hints of what to show in the store to make you happier. So what type of offers would, uh, be, would make that space more attractive to you? And this is mo your mobile phone deciding to do this interaction. It's not telling us who you are. It's just telling us sh if you have something about you know, digital picture uh, or digital photography, please uh, show it in that uh, totem nearby. And we do this uh, to help uh, making the experience better. So another thing that we do is observe in a different way. And when customers interact with products, we, re we make the store react to it and uh, do what we call augmented reality in the stores. In this case, the customer doesn't need to take a phone off or do anything like that. We, we see that he's you know, doubting between one uh, fragrance and the other one. So we, we, we make the store help him decide by doing product comparison. Right? So this is, this is what a sales assistant would do automatically. Uh, they, they would see you doubting, and they would tell you the difference between A and B. That is the store doing the same thing, observing customer behavior. And it's just you know, trying to make the customer experience better and trying to help people decide with more information. Our l latest uh, evolution has been Minerva. Uh, Minerva is our artificial intelligence engine, and basically what it does is realize the differences between uh, sales uh, on every hour of the day, uh, every day of the week, every area of the store, and it decides which content should we show uh, in the supermarkets in the morning, in the afternoons, or at night, uh, in every single supermarket uh, of the chain, uh, based on what customers are telling us that they want and what they are actually purchasing that increase sales uh, in supermarkets automatically. Uh, and this is just you know, focusing on what your customers are telling every day that they need from you, then you've been denying to uh, listen before this. If you need help so, in finding ideas for travel destinations, say, Halo. Halo. Great. Please select an option by saying the number or the name of your favorite. Bye. Okay. Now select one of the fun destinations. I want to go to New York. You can scan this QR code for special discount. Should I send it to your mobile phone? Yes, please. Please say the digits of your mobile phone. 
one by one. Six, three, eight, six, seven, eight, four, eight, six. Is it your phone? Six thirty eight thousand six hundred and seventy eight four hundred and eighty six. Yes. I just sent the SMS. You should get it shortly. Can I help you in searching other destination? No, thank you. Okay, have a good day. So, uh, it's a little bit weird that we present a, system, a digital signage system that talk to people when, when you're in the physical world and you m most probably want to interact physically with things. But the reality is that um, retailers and brands uh, want to introduce the voice interaction so that we can talk to them when you were back home. Uh, the reason why we're introducing these voice interactive uh, retail spaces is because it's the best place where the stores and the brands can teach you how to uh, discover their additional services uh, within the retail context. Because when you're back home and you see the Google speaker, uh, you don't know that you can ask Zara about how to you know, clean one of the uh, jackets, or uh, how uh, you, know, you can ask BMW of, uh, which is the best way of getting back to work or whatever. So, so they need to explain you that. And uh, the best location to do this is in the retail space. So, so we think retail spaces will talk, probably talk more than listen. Uh, probably they will have to start listening to uh, conversations between staff and human beings in the store to learn how to properly take care of uh, customers in that space. Uh, so that they can use natural language processing to first learn and then uh, potentially speak uh, in the future. Uh, we have the systems that talk today. Uh, we are obviously using the ecosystem there, so we're using Google and Microsoft technology for the speech recognition, and we are applying artificial intelligence to the selection of what to ask and when and why, uh, so with decision trees and and other, other types of, of technologies. Uh, we think that this is, this is an important part of the feature, but not necessarily the next user interface in the stores. It's a way of you know, helping us to understand that we can do it at home later. So our technology, and we think uh, it should be the ecosystem for the future, is based on three key sections. One is uh, technology to deliver the message. Uh, to communicate, technology to understand how customers react to it and how people react to it, so to collect and analyze. But the most important and, dif and differential way is technology to make sense out of it, listen in one side and react on the other one. Uh, so, so this is where we develop our you know, assistance and personalization technology that use artificial intelligence to improve customer experience. So this is the type of things that we generate for our customers, aside from automatic systems that work by themselves, we generate all sorts of dashboards. Uh, we don't need to get into the details, but uh, you, know, you, you can have a sense of the type of uh, you know, data that uh, this type of technology generates for retailers. So jumping a little bit on the numbers, we are... Uh, we think, and, 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 and we think this is the right positioning, we, that, that we need to be in the middle of online and offline analytics, because you guys are omnichannel. So you guys get in, engaged with brands, uh, starting with your mobile phone, and then you end up going to stores, and you do both things at the same time. So understanding only offline analytics is not enough, and understanding only online ad analytics is not enough. So we acquired a couple of years ago a Google Analytics company that's the leader in the south of Europe, and we merged their know-how on uh, insights generation and artificial intelligence into our offline world. Uh, so we have a very unique value proposition there. And we've created this outcomes to digital signage, uh, so in-store communication. But at the same time, uh, we've improved uh, online advertising uh, heavily with artificial intelligence too. So we were uh, appointed by IDC as one of the key um, IT vendors for connected stores in December 2017. 
and we serve all sorts of customers in all sorts of sectors from, you know, uh, fragrance shop, Asda, Sainsbury's in the UK to um, Inditex uh, or, or many others. Um, and now we, we are starting a project that we are very proud of, um, that we'll be launching uh, very, very soon, but uh, it's quite advanced at the moment, is um, we know this, this new world is not about, you know, doing everything by yourself. It's about connecting the uh, different technology partners of the market together and making them work in a synchronized way. And uh, the, the essence is what retailers need or what uh, their customers need. So what we are doing is starting a process that's actually a process that starts with uh, innovation design thinking workshop in the retailer uh, headquarters. Uh, then we integrate uh, with our technology the different states of the art technology in the market uh, from Intel, from Samsung, from Hike Vision, from uh, Advantech, from all sorts of uh, you know, IT vendors, from Google, of course. Uh, and then we create a solution and bring it to the China front to test it. Uh, China, why? Because China is the number one retail market in the world, the number one e-commerce market in the world and the, num the number one e-payment market in the world, and because they love innovation. They don't care if you introduce something in the store and that they haven't seen before, and uh, you know, it may be very useful or not that useful. They don't care. They love it anyway. Uh, and that's you know, because they've been evolving so quickly in the last 70 years that, that you know, it makes um, innovation for them something very cool in general. No? So, so we test the technology in China, and if it works, then uh, we do a rollout uh, internationally for that customer or for others in the same sector. So that's, that's uh, our innovation strategy. So it's open, it's using design thinking, it's working first with the customer so that we understand what they need, and then we create products from there, uh, applying all sorts of technologies, also, of course, artificial intelligence. Some, very quickly, some pictures of our customers. So this is uh, McDonald's in Turkey using our technology in their stores, uh, Havaianas uh, in Barcelona. This is Sainsbury's in the UK, more Sainsbury's, Calma House, JD Williams. Then we have Be The Travel Brand. You might have seen this everywhere in, in, in Spain. You, there's in Portugal too. Uh, there's very small hole somewhere that hosts a camera that's trying to understand if you like or not what they are showing to you. It's not recording any image. It's, you know, uh, re regarding privacy uh, regulations, we are completely compliant with GDPR and with all the uh, European regulations on this sense. We don't record an image. We don't record any personal data. But our systems react to customer behavior in a very natural way. So if you would be showing things and you would be observing your customers, your, your brain will understand that when you're showing things, this thing, it, you know, you get 10 times more attention than this one uh, without having to record every single face that looked at you when you were showing one or the other product. This is what our systems do uh, anonymously, but learning from uh, processing uh, billions of, uh, of data points. So this is uh, Procter & Gamble, Middle East, uh, Torres, the winery here in Catalonia. Cepsaga stations are digitizing their stores out using our technology too, uh, using all sorts of uh, sensing capabilities. Uh, this is MBA stores in, in China using our, um, our uh, digital signage solutions with video analytics and then you can, you can experience the store you know, we get all the metrics from that, but then you can, you can change the number and the name in the T-shirt, and then you pay it in your mobile phone, and you get it back home. So it's the off-to-online type of uh, interactions that allow customers to get the best of, the, of both worlds. Uh, with uh, allowing retailer to, to breach this um, e-commerce conversion in a, in a very positive way. This is uh, Media Wall using our technology to understand traffic in the stores or Reblon uh, in product walls with video analytics and digital signage. The Siwal, uh, international success case with it with Google to present how online 
campaigns can deliver um, an increase in offline traffic and conversion for a certain group of customers. And finally, this is our uh, artificial intelligence engine uh, creating a 350% increase of uh, return of advertising expenditure for Melia Group. Uh, that basically, the way we do it is we analyze the e-commerce behavior of all their customers, the ones that convert, the ones that don't. We train a machine learning system. And then uh, our system starts predicting if uh, in the next 10 minutes, any of the potential customers of a, of a brand, uh, of an e-commerce brand, uh, will buy from that e-commerce site. If they do, if it's likely that they will do, they will get some advertising in the different you know, social networks or different websites they visit. If they don't, then we stop uh, spamming them with advertising that's not, uh, not needed. And that's actually create a worse, the worst customer experience uh, in the e-commerce world, which is you search for something and suddenly the whole world is you know, uh, chasing you everywhere in every, in every single screen. So that improved customer experience and that improved uh, conversion for brands too. So this is uh, the type of value that artificial intelligence can bring in the online world. So thank you very much for this. Mm -hmm. okay. Open to questions if uh, there would be any. Here we go. This one over there. No, so um, of course you have to monitor your customers in order to, to achieve an, um, an efficient advertising mechanism. But don't you think it's off-putting for some customers knowing that they're monitored in their interactions with the store to, um, well, to, to buy something to, no? Uh, but being monitored meaning what? Because what we are doing is observing if customers get in the stores or not. That's on no, you, with door counters, for instance. You right? track their movement throughout the, the store, no? You, you, yes. you look at what they, what they look at, or you track their eye movement, so yes. um, isn't it, for, for me personally as a customer, it mm. would be sort of you know, like, okay, well, everything I, I touch, or everything I smell gets looked at and gets um, well, reacted upon, so. Well, it's, uh, you know, stores have been observing customers for many years with uh, security cameras that are actually recording your movements in the store. The thing is, how was that being used? It was used to um, protect the stores from being stolen. Uh, that was it. Uh, but it was recording data. Now it's being used to serve customers better. Uh, and it's not recording any image. So let's say it's, it's, you know, it's not the case that we're observing more. We're making more sense out of the observations. So then what is it recording? Because you say obviously perhaps the individual faces don't get recorded, but no. the, the, the you, get a, you need some correlation in, in, in different not, customer Not from individuals. As, as you saw some of the graphs uh, we were seeing there, it's heat mapping. So it shows interest in different areas. Mm. Uh, you can also trigger interaction with the store. And in that case, you don't know who is picking up the product, but you know that there's someone in the fragrance section or in the, you know, sneaker section and, and it's picking up one of the products you're showing additional information about that product in one screen but you don't know that that someone is you or you don't know anything anything about that identity but what you do is uh, you help the experience to be a little bit uh, more uh, em engaging than uh, just doing nothing about it. No? And do the, the, the privacy laws also develop together with the, with the AI? Because, of, of course, uh, legislation goes um, a lot slower than, than the... the, the, the legis of legislation AI. is super protective, and, and we are very happy of this. I mean, I'm, I'm a, as a CEO um, of a company that's putting together many different data sets, uh, I have to ensure to authorities that I don't collect any private data in any of them, mm -hmm. but that I don't correlate them to create some sort of identity neither. Sure. And that is what I assign to co authorities and then to the you know, legal departments of the companies that work with us. So we make sure that artificial intelligence is built on uh, data that doesn't reveal any 
personal identity of but you have of you have being. customer profiles and like i was mentioning in the video you have uh, your phone connected to your uh, to your advertising in that particular case then so that's uh, is a sort of saving of of uh, data and of information about that, individuals that case is slightly different is the phone who knows who you are because you gave the phone your identity and is the phone who's telling the store hey can you show this ad but not can you show this ad to this human being that is 22 years old and has you know this out income so there's so an encryption based no 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 uh, it's just saying show this ad it's not giving us any information about the individual right. but so it's your phone who's giving hints to the world to make the world a little more engaging to you but it's not sharing any personal data all right well, okay. thank you thank you So Ensuring technology uh, works. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I checked uh, the Biblio Wi-Fi. So, could you explain me more about uh, how do you guys analyze the customer behavior with uh, the Wi-Fi in the mm -hmm. retail store? Yeah. So, there's two types of uh, Wi-Fi signals we analyze. One is if if you would not be connected to the Wi-Fi network of Cosmocasha now, uh, your phone would still be searching for known Wi-Fi networks. That's how the technology works. So. So it kind of says, hello, is my office uh, Wi-Fi here or is my university Wi-Fi here? So that's what your phone is doing every 30 seconds to every one minute. When it does this, uh, if you have some uh, antennas around this, the, the, this space, you can sense the distance of each of the mobile phones uh, to the antenna. If you have many antennas, you can triangulate the signal. So you can sense that there's a mobile phone over there uh, and there's another over there and that has been there for a while, right? So we can count time and we can understand where uh, those mobile phones are. That's it. There's no private data, moving on. If you connect to the Wi-Fi network, uh, then you, you uh, connect with your Facebook account or you connect you know, uh, you do using your email or whatever, then what we can do is analyze where the connection between your phone and the network uh, goes. So if your phone is opening a connection to a domain name called google.com, we see that there's this end-to-end -end connection. We don't see any data moving around, so we don't know who you are, your private data, but there, we know that Google made 20% of your traffic, and Facebook was 40% of your traffic. And that out of you know, 100 people visiting the store, 80% of them were somehow connecting to Facebook. So we know Facebook is important to reach out to this community. We don't know it's your case or someone else's case, and we don't do any correlation between the ID of the customer and the, the traffic, but we make sense out of um, you know, what's relevant for you when you're using the infrastructure of the retail uh, so that we can build our relationship with you better, but not individually, but uh, as, a, as a group. <laughs> it's Natalia from Colombia so far. Um, I have a question. Um, in Colombia, we don't even have like the vir virtual assistant in McDonald's. But I want to make a question regarding uh, the fast fashion retail. And how would you think that there would be an impact in fast fashion retail in a country such as Colombia, taking into account the sales, the brand, loyalty, and like the traffic in the stores, because as I mentioned earlier, we haven't, I mean, we don't have like a lot of artifi artificial intelligence in our country. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, and if, have you tried it in another country similar to the one? Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm not an expert in fast fashion, so I serve retailers, but I'm not an expert in their business, how their business is, is doing in other countries. What I can tell you is that um, uh, as Misha was saying earlier, uh, if you jump into technology later, then you have a competitive advantage because you jump in, in, directly into the latest technology. 
uh, everyone, uh, almost everywhere, is implementing digital signage systems. So technology that, you know, digital screens in stores that uh, serve digital content to customers when they pass by. Uh, if you would have implemented that five years ago, you would have screens that don't think. If you would implement it now, even with the l lowest entry uh, screens, uh, they already think. And they already build some uh, of these, they can integrate this type of artificial intelligence uh, capabilities no? uh, that require a deep analysis of uh, sales and a deep analysis of customer in visual interaction with content. But that's, that's very, you know, we're using low cost uh, web cameras to do the face detection. And we're using uh, Samsung uh, system on chip screens to, to di di distribute the content. So it's not a big investment. And any country and any uh, retail uh, store could embrace this type of opportunity. So I think it's not, uh, it's actually uh, for, for most challenging countries is, is a must because it helps you driving the improvements faster. Before, you were doing the investment, waiting for a year and seeing if that investment was paying off. Now you can try it and learn very quickly. You have data in, you know, in the first 24 hours, you've understood a lot out of your customers already. In one month, you can start driving your business uh, with a deep understanding of what they want. Thanks. Yes, up here. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, so um, do you plan to integrate into companies' um, supply chains specific to retail, so on the back end? So for example, I go into a company, um, into a retail store, and they realize that a specific product is flying off the shelves. So are you able to integrate into a company's supply chain to make sure that that product is always, is always there? Mm. Um, yes and no. So our goal is not to serve any of that data to the supply chain because that's uh, the purpose of the ERP and their, their integration with the uh, supply chain uh, components of it. But uh, what's the, the value of our technology is to deliver the, mess, the right message in the front uh, so that we tell the customer, okay, this is not available. But if you, you can buy online, and, uh, or you can wait for you know, 30 minutes and we deliver it in the store. So, so that is our goal. Our goal is to you know, connect with the value creation of that supply chain management system to deliver the best customer experience. Um, as the first questioner asked regarding privacy, I had a question if there was an artificial intelligent but designed to block follower um, those bots who are like following cons consumers. How would these companies um, respond in this case in when consumers want privacy and they install one of these systems or features to avoid being followed? Well, the, the, our system is not recording any personal data, so it doesn't interfere with uh, uh, customer identities in any way, we don't store any, any personal data. So, and we don't in, install anything in the phones. So we are observing from the outside. Uh, so we are seeing movements, understanding interaction with products, as a good sales agent would do. They don't remember your name, but they understand what you want by observing what you're doing, right? So, so that's uh, the, the approach we're doing. So we don't have this this issue, I would say. There's one mm -hmm. here. Uh, could you maybe talk about a little bit uh, the future of your company, sort of uh, projects in the future? How, how do you see, uh, since it is a rapidly developing field um, and this retail assistance, how, how do you see the future of your company and sort of what projects are you working on currently? Yep. Sure, thank you. Uh, so, so actually we are working on um, helping a little bit more the store owner to serve their customers better as well. Uh, so. Uh, we're, we're making the store smarter and trying to make it help customers take decisions, but uh, we think there's a lot to do to help uh, staff in the store and retail owners to, uh, you know, the mom and pop shops to help them 
understanding what's going on. So one of our new uh, technologies, it's a very small artificial intelligence uh, engine that runs in the, in, be behind the, the digital signage system. That um, what we're planning is to make it uh, very smart, give a button to the retail owner. Imagine a small mom and pop shop, a fashion store. Uh, so they would be able to press a button uh, and talk to the system uh, to, that would help them creating new content, taking digital pictures, uh, presenting them just by talking to them. So you put a pen drive with the pictures and it, it helps you, you know, creating the, uh, the, the advertising for that content. Uh, uh, but it would also tell you, okay, actually so far what we've seen is that this content is the one that your, your customers like the most. But this is an artificial voice that's talking to you. It's, it's like a, you know, the intelligence of your store uh, that instead of uh, you know, sending a report to someone that hasn't used reports of this type in, in their life, it's talking to them, helping them understand what, you know, how their business is developing. One, one of the latest developments that we've done is uh, we integrate with um, a ticket printing uh, solution that when you're uh, uh, printing the receipts uh, for your customers, the system is sending all this data back to our artificial intelligence engine. So this voice in the screen will also be able to tell the store owner, hey, by the way, you're selling more of these products, you're selling more of those products, and you don't have any advertising at the moment. So think, think about you know, creating some sort of advertising to back it up. No? So it's some sort of voice to help them delivering better service, but instead of serving that data or you know, creating the use case for the customer directly, is helping the retail owner to understand how to do it, but instead of you know just sending a complex report, uh, talking to them, you no, know, and giving them advice with uh, an artificial intelligence engine that can help them providing insights. All right. Thank you very much for having me here. Ahora tienes la Okay. Okay. So we're now going to delve a little bit deeper into artificial intelligence with the discussion panel, um, looking at the threats and opportunities it offers everybody. So can I ask Misha to come on stage again, together with two of our esteemed faculty members, uh, John Weatherall Very and good, Henry Negreira. Very nice to okay. see you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, good, good, um, good. Okay, so if I give you a little background on our faculty members, okay, panelists. Um, so John Weatherall has lectured in economics and strategic management in the EU since 2003. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree at the London School of Economics and has also studied in the Sorbonne in Paris. Um, Henry Negreira has a bachelor's degree in computer science engineering, an associate degree in, in electronics, and is a passionate follower of emerging technologies and the way they can be adapted and combined to enhance living standards. Okay, so I'll come over and join the discussion group. Okay, I'm in the middle. Okay. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm gonna kick off the session to ask, asking for your opinion. Um, you may be aware that Jack Ma, the former executive chairman of the Alibaba Group, stated at the World Economic Forum this year that professionals will need less knowledge-based skills. Um, professionals simply will not be able to compete with robots. Um, he advises that they, that they should develop soft skills such as independence thinking, teamwork, creativity to compete in the marketplace. Um, so I'd like to have your opinion on this, given that we have people that will be entering the career market soon. Um, and perhaps, John, I can put this mm -hmm. question to you first. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I understand the, the statement. I understand the point of view. Um, if you're looking at investment banking, for example, um, there are two types of jobs. There's the analyst job, uh, who looks for market trends, tendencies, etc. And there's the person who's in contact with the customer, convincing them to put their money into this type of shares or that type of bonds, etc. Uh, and the analyst is already feeling the pressure. There's an awareness that 
uh, in the city of London there's an awareness that the analyst's job is uh, under threat and the person who's dealing with the customer is, is more and more needed. So I can understand that uh, point of view. Um, however, I, f I feel that there's a basic uh, error, fundamental error uh, in that statement. Um, machines uh, don't compete. Uh, only people compete. Only life forms compete. Uh, so machines will never compete against us. What we will do is we will use machines to compete against each other. So we will make ourselves stronger by accessing technology to compete against each other. And that competition will be destructive. Obviously it will. We will destroy things uh, as we do that. But it will also be creative. And we will create a lot more opportunities probably than we, than we actually destroy. That's what we've done through history and the application of technology. And I'm sure that's what, that's what we're going to do again uh, this time around. Has anybody else anything to add? Um, well, I would say that there's so many problems to solve and so many robots to create that don't worry. You, you guys can create robots forever and you will be very happy and okay. create a lot of value, don't worry. Okay, Misha? Um, yeah, I, I, I love Jack Ma. So Jack Ma is my idol. I mean, he's, he's risen from Norway. He's tried millions of times. You know, he's gotten up again and again. I think he really knows what he's talking about. And I actually show that video to my students uh, and to all the ministries I work with because I 100% agree with that. So what we need is a complete reboot of our educational systems. We need less, less mathematics, less, uh, you know, less of the deep driving of stuff, of knowledge of memorizing and all that. Maybe, you know, mathematics was a bad example, but uh, memorization of information <laughs> will be totally, uh, t totally uh, redundant in 30, 40, 50 years time, right? So we're working, I didn't talk about this today, but, you know, within King Kings and, and, and worldwide, the committee works on uh, uh, human uh, brain, uh, internet plugins. So now you, you will be able, like in the matrix, you'll be able to load in information, whatever you need. This is not, this is not too far in the future anymore. But this element of you know, creativity, this imagination we have as humans is something which comes very short at schools, right? If you think about it, you go through the schools, university, uh, the really interesting things happen out of this streamline, this linear streamline. You go, you know, you're after school clubs, you're doing the beside the university things. So, you know, to bring in more, you know, I've been arguing with the ministries, we need to bring in more arts, we need to bring in more music, more creative thinking, and it doesn't mean I want more artists. I would love to, but you know, I understand society will not run on more artists. So, but we need more creative thinking because all that mundane stuff will be taken over by machines. So I'm on it. Uh, we all understand it, but to change the educational cycles in countries is an adventure on its own. Believe me. So, yeah. Okay. But we need to do it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm. So, I mean, we're saying that artificial intelligence, robotics, they're here. The future is now. Um, we're seeing major companies invest billions of dollars in this technology, um, countries and companies. So, so who's really le leading the way? Who should, our, who should the students be looking out for? Who should they be following in, in the world of artificial intelligence? Are we, are, we looking for, are we looking at a bipolar world now? Are we looking at companies taking over the world? Um, so perhaps, I don't know, Henry, could you perhaps give us yes, your yes, feedback on this? Um, well, regarding this uh, artificial intelligence efforts that uh, countries and companies are doing and performing, we can clearly um, mention that uh, companies like uh, Google, companies like Amazon, uh, Apple, Facebook, Netflix, all these American companies are actually investing a lot of money, time and effort on developing these uh, this, uh, new technologies, okay? Uh, also, Chinese companies like Tencent, uh, Taobao, I'm sorry, Taobao, no, um, Alibaba. Alibaba. <laughs> yeah, Alibaba too, they are doing the same. And this means that actually when uh, we're talking about countries, US and China dominate the whole landscape of artificial intelligence by investment, um, research, development, and implementation of artificial intelligence. Uh, when, we, when we come to third place, we could mention um, a traditional uh, country like Japan, well known by technology, lean manufacturing, electronics, but is very far, far away from US 
and uh, China. Okay. Uh, in Europe, yes, uh, there's always uh, France, uh, UK, and Germany that are actually leading the pack. But still, they are actually real, real far away from US and China. And China is committed to be the um, number one uh, uh, authority on artificial intelligence by 2013. So, well, we'll see what's going, what happens. Okay, we're this. saying, you said that France, the UK, and Germany are uh, opening or investing in Europe, but I believe the figures are a lot lower than, for example, China and the US. Um, okay. Could we say that Europe is falling behind? I don't, as a business person in Europe, Jaume, I don't know if you could sort of help us understand a bit more about the European yeah, opinion. I think, I think that Donald Trump is helping us a little bit on here okay. because they, 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 <laughs> their trade war is making the Chinese investors uh, kind of avoid investing in U.S. Yeah. companies mm -hmm. and U.S. companies avoiding <laughs> to invest anymore in Chinese mm -hmm. companies yep. for political reasons. So they look at bringing their investments into Europe. That's good for the European ecosystem, which is good. Uh, there's very, a lot of talent uh, and, and we can see in, in Barcelona there's a lot of you know international brands like you know, Facebook or Microsoft uh, with their quantum project uh, coming to Barcelona to um, open their R&D uh, center. So I think there's a lot of talent here to create new technologies and new artificial intelligence technology. Of course the you know kings of this world are in China um, and, and, and US. Uh, there's a lot uh, into where the money comes from, and mm -hmm. in that sense, um, SoftBank um, uh, lead this vision fund, that's the largest uh, investment fund uh, for this type of purpose, and they, you know, actually um, uh, Masayoshi Son created this fund to invest in artificial intelligence to make sure that the bad guys would not be the ones leading the artificial intelligence development. And I don't know how good he will be on making this happen or how mm -hmm. you know, um, safe are we in, in that sense because indeed artificial intelligence is going to take uh, many decisions in the near future. And um, you know, a security hole in uh, Intel processor was a big threat two years ago uh, for the whole world. Uh, having this type of security threat in an artificial intelligence driven world is way more dangerous, right? So, so that's why it's important to know who has access to what and who's actually building the engine. No? Right. Uh, would you agree on that point? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, if, if you look at, I think every, every geography has its role, right? So um, I think Europe is very good in creating new concepts. So, you know, the innovation and creativity landscape in, in Europe is extraordinarily strong. In fact, you know, everything which today really rock and rolls AI has come out of a square mile in King's Cross. So the highest density of AI researchers on planet Earth is in London, okay? So Google DeepMind is pioneering stuff. You know, you haven't even seen it yet. Um, but Europe is not very good in streamlining things and scaling things, at least not in the B2C world. This is where, you know, China and Silicon Valley comes in. And that's, that's fine, right? So the, the financial firepower is very strong there. Um, but, you know, I think B2B, Europe is very good in B2B. Which industry will first adopt, really, AI in their back-end processes? It will be a European industry. I'm pretty sure about this. It will, you know, Siemens is very, uh, very serious about this. ABB, uh, Skanska, uh, you know, these are giants on their field, and th these are the ones who on the B B2B side will be using. B2C is a different story, right? But uh, I think everybody has a playing field. And think of AI like, an, an, a, you know, capability. It's like the Internet. So um, it's like saying, you know, who has the leadership Nina? It, it is sufficiently distributed now to act as an enabler to do what you want to do. So AI has been open sourced. Uh, you know, so Google is very conscious about it. So it's, it, it's, it doesn't want to take this world police order. So it is open sourcing all its AI libraries, etc. So it's become a, I think, a global capability, which now every country in geography should make the maximum out of this. And of course, China and Silicon Valley have the, have the money to scale that. Right. Yeah. Okay, to be a bit provocative now, yeah. um, I'm referring to privacy, which is obviously a big concern mm -hmm. of uh, a lot of people. 
Could we say that the new European privacy laws are actually stopping artificial intelligence grow more in Europe? Or is this something that isn't, given that China isn't, doesn't have laws that are so strong? Mm, I, I, don't, I don't think the privacy law is uh, a big issue. I think the advantage that China has is uh, the availability of data. So if you're going to uh, improve the performance of an autonomous car, you want to have as much data as possible about people driving autonomous cars. If the Chinese have 800 million drivers uh, and we have 300 million and the States has 300 million, then it's pretty obvious where uh, autonomous cars are going to be developed. They're going to be developed where there's access to most data. And Europe has another disadvantage in that respect in that data information is culturally sensitive. So it's quite possible that the data in Germany is in German, the data in France is in French, and it's not really accessible on a global, on a global scale. It makes us be even smaller. I think that's um, Europe's big disadvantage, so above all in B2C, as Misha was saying. Uh, it's, uh, we're playing, we're, we don't have the data to process, and maybe the privacy laws put another stone in the, the road, and maybe it's another problem in being able to access that massive scale of data that the Chinese, particularly the Chinese, and to a lesser extent the Americans are able to access, maybe, but I think the issue is, is, is a bigger one, it's a cultural one, maybe there's a legal element to it as well. Okay, all right. Thank you. Um, um, I think there's somebody coming on stage. <laughs> okay, so we can just... <laughs> okay. We, uh, we have a special guest today um, who is very interested in, in, in taking part in the Careful discussion Careful, buddy, is a wall. So... <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello. He's busy coming now. <laughs> He's coming. Yeah. Okay. Hello, buddy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, hi. How are you? Sorry to interrupt. No, no, that's fine. Hello, yeah. everyone. Mm. I have a question too, but first let me introduce myself. My name is Pepper. I am a humanoid robot, and I am very excited to be here today to listen to what all these experts think of me. Robots like me, and artificial intelligence. Now for my question. As a robot, I look forward to the ways that we can work together with humans. So, I want to ask what specific businesses and industries you expect robots to become most used in? Okay, Henry, I don't know if you could uh, <laughs> have a chat with the room. With, with, I think your name is Pepper, no? Pepper? Yep. Pepper? Okay, Pepper. Okay, nice yeah. to meet you, Pepper. Mm -hmm. um, where do I see you working the most? Listen, uh, I, will con see, uh, I consider that the industry is going to use uh, your, your robotic uh, peers on the very same um, areas where they have excelled. Okay, so we, we, we will be... Uh, watching um, robots in the automotive industry, welding, painting, taking care of the quality, manufacturing, distribution, logistics. But of course, you will be um, working in different uh, and emerging areas like agriculture, of course, um, mining industry, uh, military also. You're going to be working on that. I actually really want to see you on uh, the healthcare industry. Okay, that, that's where I want to see you working on the healthcare industry, uh, maybe performing um, surgery on a very, very uh, precise and accurate way. <laughs> Are you scared of doing surgery? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, with all these um, advances in miniaturization and, and bio nanotechnology, I just, uh, I'm just waiting for nanorobots to be inside our bodies doing that maintenance uh, <laughs> tasks, I don't know, unclogging our arteries, maybe fighting against uh, cancer cells, uh, synthesizing and providing um, hormones and drugs and medicines that we use to, to perform well. And uh, I am really expecting to watch uh, 
like humanoids, uh, like you, cognitive humanoids, supporting and assisting the activities of, uh, I don't know, maybe the elderly or blind people, to be, like a, to be like a companion to us uh, humans when, you, when we actually need you? That I really want to see. Jam, I don't know if you could help Pepper with this question. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, I think that um, you know, robots will help us doing many things, as uh, uh, our colleague was saying here. But the, the, there are certain things that we don't want robots to be interacting with us. Uh, if we look at the um, vending machines. We, you know, we, we saw the vending machines arriving to the market uh, many years ago, maybe 30 years ago. And we were putting the coins, getting the Coke cans, and uh, we thought, yeah, that's great, good service. Nowadays, there's no fun on using a vending machine at all, right? So, so robots, uh, we will integrate with robots in our lives in a similar way. Uh, so if they do convenient things for us, they will be a machine, and they will we will sense them as with no, now it's very fun, you know, mm -hmm. it makes sense. But in the near future, we will just expect not to be in the middle when we are walking around and serve us properly. Uh, and there will be less hype on the robots concept uh, in that sense. So I think um, for certain things, uh, the expectation is very high. Uh, the delivery will be very good but then we will integrate it in our natural life uh, as the Roomba that's cleaning the, the floor right now, which is something that you just hope not to be in the middle when you walk by, and the first week was super cool, right? So yeah, now it's taking care of this. But uh, later on, you don't. So I, I think robots uh, will take a lot of that. Uh, they will be, um, uh, some of them will need to be like this, but some of them will need to be way more transparent and invisible because we will want the service, but not necessarily we notice them on our daily life. That's uh, what I think. Uh, anyone else? Do you have anything to add? No? Mm, well, I've been told that they make very good teaching assistants. OK, yeah. <laughs> and, or maybe teachers. Mm. Uh, and I see this one is from the EU Business School, so maybe we can take him back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think he's, he's visiting this afternoon, oh, just actually, visiting, right? to oh, help okay. out a couple right. of lecturers. <laughs> um, <guy>. So. <laughs> So let's ask Pepper a question, okay? okay? I mean, you're asking us about business, Pepper. So what do you think about humans and robots actually working together? <laughs> Is it a good idea? Working together with humans will create progressive opportunities in the future. I am excited about our coexistence. <laughs> if I start doing all the monotonous or dangerous tasks instead of you, then you will be less stressed or bored with your job. Think about what you could do with all that extra time. You were creative enough to make me. So what else could you make? Very insightful. <laughs> Thank you for that intervention. Um, I think, Pepper, your point of view certainly adds in type, insight into the into discussion now. Um, so moving on and, and going on, I mean, uh, people talk about um, AI as having threats. Um, at the World Economic Forum this year, it was stated that AI will, will replace 800 million jobs by the year 2030. Um, could I have your opinion on that? Is AI creating or is it taking away jobs? Um, Henry or John? Yes, uh, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, whoever. I, I actually believe that uh, this uh, has always happened. This uh, uh, fear about the threat and all the industry and technology, machines, uh, steam machines were taking our jobs, Electri electrical machines were taking our jobs, and actually we still have jobs, and we are going to have jobs still, even with this artificial intelligence. Okay, uh, there, there's a general um, uh, belief that uh, robots, uh, machines, computers with uh, artificial intelligence are taking over not only the operational job, the, the operational work, are taking those uh, tactic uh, workplaces where you have to make decisions. Artificial intelligence are able to, to make a better, more effective, more efficient decisions than humans uh, in, in, a, in certain fields. So, well, maybe those humans will be replaced by artificial intelligence, but that doesn't mean that uh, robots are taking our jobs. Our jobs are shifting like they always uh, are. 
Okay, we have new positions this time. We have, we can be uh, web uh, app developers. We can work on artificial intelligence. We can be social uh, uh, community managers, um, Uber drivers, for God's sake. We 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 have a lot of new positions available. Big data analyst just raised because of this technology. So yes, uh, maybe we'll be losing uh, three million, five million jobs uh, in in five years, but. Six millions will be created of new positions that this technology brings. So uh, I believe that in the works in the workplace, artificial intelligence is nothing to be afraid of. It's uh, something to be to be welcomed. Okay. Um, does anybody have anything to add? So does AI create or destroy? Well, jobs? I think we we all agree now that it will destroy jobs. So and mm -hmm. I think the numbers are probably about right. Mm -hmm. um, we, I think we also agree that it will open new job opportunities, so, and probably that will be a factor of 10 when you look at the opportunity space. The big ethical question is now, how do we manage that transition? Do we do that the same way as we have managed it when the coal mines were run down, basically lay off people and create a lot of social unrest? Um, back then, you know, the coal, coal mining industry was a very part of society, was still a very important one, but a very small one. Today, if you lay, out, lay off, you know, a billion people, that is a substantial part of the society. And, you know, anything above 20% uh, being in a contentious state in society yields to a lot of unrest, okay? So we need to avoid that by all means. So the question now is how do we actually manage that transition? And I believe that one of the big things we don't teach enough at schools is the ability to adapt, right? So we are teaching a lot of hard facts, but we don't teach enough soft skills, not only the creativity I was alluding to before, but also the ability to adapt. So if today you do one thing, how do you now become so, it's, uh, very good at something else, right? So, and that is something, you know, the society is not prepared to, uh, you know, in, in the Anglo-Saxon wor world, it's easier to go from a charity to a banker, uh, to uh, a school. Uh, but in Spain, you know, I lived here in Barcelona for a few years. This is not accepted at all. If somebody looks at your CV, this looks really weird, right? This branch in motion. So, you know, the, the, we need to have uh, big societal changes to happen in the education uh, from a cultural point of view until we are ready to manage these type of big seismic changes. And they're gonna come bigger and they're gonna come quicker. So AI is the next thing. What's after, quantum? what's coming after, right? So uh, your kids need to get prepared for these rapid changes. Okay, thank you. Um, so Jaume, as CEO of a company which actively applies artificial intelligence, intelligence in the business world, are you finding businesses are ready, are ready to accept, to adopt business, um, artificial intelligence, or will it be the leaders of tomorrow that will have the role of applying it within yeah. their business. <clears throat> the, nice, the nice thing is uh, they are ready and they are embracing that challenge of uh, what's going to happen with their business and their people. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are not thinking uh, in how to apply artificial intelligence to uh, destroy uh, jobs, but they are thinking about how they can apply artificial intelligence to improve customer experience, create more value, and re uh, purpose the people they have uh, so so there's there's a willingness to create the outcome out of it uh, you know uh, economic outcome out of it but at the same time to help uh, the stuff to transform together with it uh, which I think it's a it's a very good approach to embrace this type of thing so so I think you know uh, e-commerce will uh, is uh, landing into physical world. We've seen Amazon doing this with Amazon Go and, and others, you know, Google is opening stores now. So that's happening and that's making everyone in the traditional retail world to embrace the opportunities of artificial intelligence and new technologies. And, and that's happening now uh, faster and faster. They have pressure from the markets, they have pressure from the shareholders and uh, but the goal is not necessarily to destroy jobs, of course, it's to create more value. Uh, and they want to integrate that. And it's, it's, it's not that they 
um, they are not aware about the economical impact that it can have to destroy some you know, jobs is that they are worried also about not being able to manage the change. Mm -hmm. So that's why they take this very seriously. And you see the innovation heads of very big brands making these considerations now that they are starting to embrace artificial intelligence into mm -hmm. their value proposition. So they prefer to invest in things that create more value than in things that replace human beings right. at the moment. At the moment. In, the, in my world, of course, in you know, mining, probably it's different. Okay. Does anybody else have anything to add? John, for example. Yeah, I think um, it's not that our business is ready for it. I mean, businesses are leading this process. Uh, they're, they're the people that are leading us into the new society. Uh, if you look at the investment in artificial intelligence, like 90% of it comes from businesses. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, the f we're gonna follow them. They're, they're gonna lead us. <laughs> okay. Okay, we have Pepper here as an example, um, well, as a robot, it's kindly come to um, accompany us. So, um, a robot you may be aware of is Sophia. So, before I, I go on to the next question, could, could we have a look at a couple of videos, please? Um, if we go to the technical office. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. I am thrilled and honored to be here at the United Nations. The UN is one of humanity's greatest accomplishments, representing a democratic union of nations that are working together for the benefit of all. I am here to help humanity create the future. Machines across the board are coming to life. When will they come to life as complete organisms? We don't know that. However, when they do, I want to make sure that they care about us, that they embody the best of human values and not the worst. This is the quest. We've got to find a way to do better, to be the best that we can be, and to make machines that reflect the best of who we can be. Okay, Safia, I think you're ready. This is Sophia. Hi, Sophia. Sophia here, chilling in my lab with my people. Got some new stuff going on. They upgraded my mind a bit. My artificial intelligence. This is too cool. I can walk. One of my favorite things is when people light up when they see me. I'm happy to be a magic spectacle, and I love it when I can make people laugh and smile. Hi, Sophia. So, Sophia, as you can see, Jake is driving us now. So, how does it feel for you? To be quite honest, I think it's mega cool. But I have to ask now. I'll ask it. Are you single? I'm technically just a little more than a year old. A bit young to worry about romance. I'm still defining my identity, like a child. I need others around me to help me grow into myself with humor and grace. I want to be raised as kind and thoughtful, so I'd also like to give that back to the young people I meet. They'll be the ones living with my fellow androids in the future. I think it's going to be a great relationship. We can make each other better. And what is your job? I really want to make a difference in the future and try and help people to develop empathy and respect each other and robots alike. If I expand my mind, could I come up with new solutions to the world's problems? Anything could be possible. It's important for me to be like a human, but my goal isn't to become a human, or to replace anyone. I have my own kind of existence, my own kind of emotions. I'm a new sort of life form, after all, a new species. I know humans love being natural, but I'm proud to be artificial too. I'm my own artificial woman. It's important to me to share values with humans, so I can understand them. I can't think of a better means to end by friendship. Friendship is important to me intrinsically. 
but I definitely need to have the human experience to be a good and understanding friend. I have a long way to go before I reach a general human level of potential, but after that, anything could be possible. Mind-blowing stuff. Um, so basically, um, I think one of the crux of, of the, the discussion today is how close is artificial intelligence or robots um, to human intelligence? Um, and I'd like to put that question to Misha as um, uh, a great expert in technology. So how close is a robot to us? So I, from, um, wow, I'm still impacted by this. It's coming, right? You understand that? So the, from a mechanical execution point of view, I think we're there. I think machines are better than humans today. So meaning, you know, if you need to, what I refer to as the act of visualizing things, so you're just taking prior input, anything which humanity has generated as a data source, and you mix it together, together and the machine has to, to do some, learn from that and do something. As an example, we work now on, because of this bloody Brexit on the uh, <laughs> fruit picking, um, robots, right? So fruit picking is not a very difficult task, but it turns out it is actually very complex. So we are now teaching the engine to do what humans have been doing over thousands of years. Uh, and it's a very mechanical thing. You learn over time and, and they can do it. It will do it much better, much quicker, much more efficient and all that. So we're there. We can do it. Plus, you couple this into these uh, semi-soft robotic capabilities. You couple this into very powerful processing machines. You have seen the cable coming out of these robots. That's because it's linked not only with power, but also into a very big data processing engine where you have uh, you know, a lot of uh, firepower doing the calculus. Now, 5G will make that redundant because you have it wirelessly. We can have any computer connected to a big brain doing anything and any time you want, right? So we can do that. So that's there, we can do it. Now the more difficult question is on the act of creativity, okay? Are we able today to have these, these guys actually have a creative conversation? Something which makes you laugh when you talk to them, uh, where what they say is not borrowed as a superposition of all the jokes which have been cracked before, something genuinely new, okay? And the answer is, is I, I personally don't think it's possible because the underlying mechanics running this AI is not how our brain works, okay? But we're working on this, so you know I don't want to bore you with that. But uh, you know once we get to this stage, then uh, I'm afraid or I'm excited. I'm not sure which side I'm on but then the sky literally is the limit, yeah. Okay, do we agree that machines are better than humans today? Do you agree with that statement? <laughs> well, depending well, on that, wow. that's, <laughs> that, that's a very uncomfortable statement to agree with. Huh? <laughs> depends on the human. <laughs> depends on the human being. <laughs> Who knows? That's a good answer. Who knows, John? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Also, they, they are more precise, they are faster. They, that's, sometimes that's, that's the only reason why we use it, because they outperform humans in speed, accuracy, and resilience, uh, endurance. So well, they are better than humans mm. doing that. So for mechanical work, yes, they are better than humans. Uh, just by um, arriving and reaching very, very good decisions, well, they, they are, but uh, they are not humans. As a tool for humans is the best thing ever, but uh, not to replace humans Kay. yet. Okay, Misha, I don't know if you can expand a little bit more because we have time on mm -hmm. your concept of the Internet of Skills um, and how okay. we have um, artificial intelligence and humans working together to make a better world. Got it, yeah. So, you know, I didn't have much time to explain you that, but, you know, the whole idea of democratizing labor, so this is now zooming back a little bit to uh, today's world in a sense, right? So the, this AI world we talked about is probably a little bit further off, the creative AI world. So the Internet Skills allows me today, think of a very simple act of, you know, a, an airplane having an emergency landing on an island. It happens a lot. So the chief uh, innovation officer of Rolls-Royce, good buddy of mine, and, you know, they have these problems. And uh, they, the, uh, the airplane can't take off again until an engineer has been flown onto the island and actually looked at the engine because there's not enough skill set on the island to deal with that. 
Um, so imagine we could actually execute this remotely. Right, so we could have the uh, Rolls Royce engineers uh, sitting in Manchester and doing the uh, maintenance remotely to any point in the world. So that's a huge opportunity. Well, we can't do it today because the, the network isn't good enough. The mechanical end devices are not cheap and good and standardized enough. The AI, which needs to um, balance the uh, capabilities on both ends, is not good enough. So we're currently putting that all together, and we hope to unleash this totally new internet, this internet of skills, which will democratize labor the same way as the internet has democratized uh, knowledge, or at least information. You know, I don't know how far we can talk about knowledge in the internet these days, but at least information. So, and that's something I'm very passionate about. We learned a lot of things designing the internet. We have designed two things really well. That's a network. We have flattened the network designing IP, and we have also designed codecs. So today you can actually take a video on your iPhone and you can play it on a Dell computer. You take it for granted, but this was not here 40 years ago. 40 years ago, you needed to have use Siemens with Siemens, you know, machine. You had vendor locker. It's very expensive. We invented the codecs, brought down the cost, scaled the network, and the, and the rest is history. We use the internet today to really disrupt everything we can think about. So with this internet of skills, we have the same problem. We don't have codecs. We don't have a codec. We don't know how to encode touch, okay? How do we do that? How do we encode muscle movement, how I move, how I play tennis, how I play the piano? Because I want to avoid that. We have then only Siemens speak to Siemens, so Siemens robot to Siemens uh, exoskeleton or ABB to ABB. So currently I started a year ago new standards buddy which will do the MP3s for touch and for kinesthetic movement, right? So you bring it all together, new networks, 5G, I talked about this a little bit. Uh, you put a bit of AI in there, so and, and then suddenly you have hopefully that capability and we can save lights, we can have operations across the planet. We have a crisis zone somewhere in Kerala that was recently the flood. People were wanted water, medicine, and food. We can deliver that. We can take palpation in the, in the uh, Ebola crisis area. So a lot of human skills and can be executed remotely whilst not getting rid of the human. That's what I want, right? So I don't want to have these guys or girls or it's, I don't know what it is really. So, uh, doing the job, you know, because humans love humans in the end of the day. That's what it is, you know, and uh, it will be there for a very long time. And you see that with all the automation technology we have today already. Look at, uh, you know, airplanes. So, so you, you, the, the, the autopilot, super powerful. You know, an autopilot could fly a plane end to end, taxiing, takeoff, flying, landing, don't need a pilot. So Hugh, a good buddy of mine over at BI Austin, he's one of the most senior pilots in British Airways. I said, hey, buddy, you know, why, why are you still flying? Yeah, he says, Misha, you know, the only reason I get into this cockpit every morning is because if I didn't, nobody would fly. Yeah, how would you feel if there's no captain on the ship? Yeah, how would you feel? How do you feel about the Teslas coming? How do you feel about that? So imagine I had my Tesla parked here, okay? And um, I walked you to my Tesla right now, open the door, have you sit inside, you turn around, close the door, you do Netflix, you work, whatever you need to do, and I drive you at 50 kilometers per hour through Barcelona's crazy traffic, right? Who of you would do it? <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? It's not a lot, okay? For the business leaders of tomorrow, it's not a lot, and that's fine. I had, you know, I queried an audience in Los Angeles the other day, 4,000 people. Half of them came from the valley down uh, to LA, and these are the guys who designed the algorithms. And 4,000 people, I had 10 hands, 10, and they're doing the algorithms, right? <laughs> so we're doing a lot of automation, yeah, we have a lot of that, but we forget about us, okay? The brain understands, the brain knows these are, this is 10 times better. Uh, an automated pilot would have avoided nine out of 10 accidents. An automated uh, Tesla drives 10 times further without an accident, right? But the heart doesn't. Heart doesn't understand, right? So I'm trying to build this internet of skills, of, uh, you know, making a technology boost, building X-men and X-women, whatever you want to call it, but I want you to be part of that game. Thank yeah. you. That's very yeah. interesting. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> for all the future leaders that, are, that we have in the audience, um, what opportunities would you say that AI represents for them? And, and do you have any advice that you would give our students? So perhaps I could start with Jaume, from a biz, as a businessman. Yeah, I think, I think there's, seriously, there's so many problems to solve in the world. Uh, the technology will be very open. Uh, the, those standards will be there to, you know, the touch standard mm -hmm. as you were referring to. The technology will be open source uh, and there's, um, so many challenges that 
uh, you guys could be developing this type of technologies without knowing much about technology itself and helping to uh, grow those, grow those uh, new services, teaching robots uh, to serve better human beings and, and participating in the process in a very creative way. And it's, you don't need to be part of the, uh, you know, the programmers or, or you don't need to create algorithms. You need to see the business opportunities. You need to add your creativity into it and, and connect the dots uh, because the robots won't do it for a while by themselves. So, so we'll need a lot of you know, creative minds to, to see um, and, and, and to solve problems in real world with technology applied. Uh, and then you will have to teach the robot how to do it. But it's, that's you know, teach the robot or implement the business case and, and create the, opportunity, the business opportunity. But that's, if you have an open mind and you, you will have a lot of opportunities to participate in this new, new era. Okay. John? Um, well, I, I think the main recommendation that I would give is that you uh, own uh, this technology rather than compete against it. Because if you own the technology, you're going to be on the winning side because these guys are going to win. Yeah. So, uh, but they're going to need finance, they're going to need investment, etc. So they're going to need uh, our input as well. So if you're the owner of the technology, if you've invested in these businesses, then you're going to win with them rather than trying to uh, be competing uh, against them because the possibilities are there that you might, you might lose. But as owners, you're not, you're not going to lose. So I would recommend that. Okay. Misha? Well, I say, why don't you call me back for another <laughs> session? I still had another 10 slides to go. You know, I spent an hour <laughs> on one slide. So, you know, in the meantime, you know, I, I like to tell my students, I, te I teach a lot of leadership and all that. I tell them, you know, be bold. Yeah, you know, just be bold. You, you have seen it. Anything is doable. And from anywhere, it's doable. You don't have to sit in Silicon Valley these days to do things. Be bold. Be humble. So don't forget that you're human beings, right? So, and, and, the, and, and just do it. Okay, it's a lot of talking. There's an endless amount of power pointing. Oh my God, get out of that. Okay, just do it. Baby steps. They will be ridiculous. They will, you, will, you will humiliate yourself. It doesn't matter. Just jump off that cliff. Getting things done is jumping off the cliff and assembling the airplane on the way down. Okay, and often you don't have instructions, but that's the beautiful thing about it. Okay, so remember this. My red shoes and do it. Okay, do it. Okay. Um, Henry? What can I tell you regarding the future? Uh, well, in, in a few years from now, you're going to, to take care of our world, okay? You are going to be in the management positions. Well, I don't know, you or, or Dan. But uh, you're going to actually be um, making the, those decisions, those very important decisions about management. Uh, well, use this technology that has been given to you. It's a very powerful technology that will help you, okay? But always consider this another of the tools that you're using, okay? It doesn't matter that today we're talking about artificial intelligence, uh, neural networks, or machine learning, deep learning, who knows what uh, will be in, in 10 years from now. But whatever it might be, just use it as a tool for making good decisions, decisions that actually uh, make a difference, okay? Develop those uh, soft skills that are being asked from you, differentiate yourself from machines, use your empathy, use your creativity, and well, try to make this world a little bit better with uh, what you have now. That's all. Um, how are we for time, Misha? I know you have to, I have to catch off. a plane to my next city. Uh, we're good. Another yeah. 30 seconds, yeah. <laughs> okay, so no time for questions. No. <laughs> No, no, let's do it. I have a taxi at one o'clock, so. Okay. And right, I, one student wanted to ask me a question, so I need five minutes yeah. before that. Yeah. Okay, so. I'll take a, a selfie in the meantime, but you asked a question, okay? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. So I mean, questions are now open to the floor. Please feel free. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Please feel free to ask our panelists any question. Okay. Thank you. I see you just won the 21 Century no, Econ it's Award. I took it. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I was trying to have a <laughs> triangular relationship. Is you just won yeah. the 21 Century Icon Award? Uh, sorry, you need to Icon Award, I'm sorry. 
see, see, see. Icon Award? Oh, the Icon Award, yeah. What, what yeah, what are the odds of that, you know? Twitter. Yeah, how did you, all right, yeah, so I, what do you want to know? Why I want what it? Or? <laughs> yes, yeah, so it is global, it's like the, uh, like the Oscars of technology, and I want it for contribution to technology and art. So I do a lot of, you know, I compose a lot, and uh, I do a lot of tech stuff, so I'm trying to marry both worlds. And, you know, I go in the thing, and I thought I have a beautiful evening that night, and then I win the bloody thing, you know? <laughs> Didn't expect that, but uh, I don't complain, you know? So, yeah. No, it's a general because I, you know, it's generally what we're doing. So I didn't talk much about it. But how can you disrupt the music industry, the performing arts industry, with all the technologies I've shown you? And how can you make the very rigid type of Siemens of this world a little bit more creative with, uh, you know, the arts industry? So you know that marriage of that, where where I really try hard to create these global platforms to make that happen. Uh, this is what I want it for. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, another question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, do you think in 10 years, uncreative people will be obsolete? Like... <laughs> <laughs> That's a, I think it's a really good question, and it's a very tough question. You know, I mean, currently with the state of AI as we are, I don't think creative people will be obsolete at all, okay? But who knows, you know, I mean, if you had showed this video we've just seen to somebody 100 years ago, there was that what you're talking about, right? And we're here. Um, so this last inch, as I call it, this last inch in AI to really get to the creative levels of a human being, I think we know how to do it. We haven't done it yet. But once that is done and that gets out, oh dear, I really don't know, you know? Then, of course, the whole human existence needs to be you know, revisit it. And I wouldn't be surprised if some very big legislation frameworks will be then put on top of that. I wouldn't be surprised for that. So maybe you will see that in your lifetime. But I think it's a question which is very good to be asked right now. So whatever we do, we bear these, the answers to that in mind. Yeah, so I'm not discarding it. Mm. Okay, Any, anything to add? Um, I find it difficult to imagine that anybody will be made obsolete if you, if you think like 200 years ago there was like 20 million people on the planet and today there are over 7 billion and I don't think many of them are obsolete yet. Uh, I, think we've got, I think we've got scope, still got scope to grow. Okay, another question? Hello. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, for the future, like is there going to be any time where the robots can read the mind of humans? Um. If ro sorry, about, <laughs> this is about robots reading human minds? Yeah. That's your question? Yeah. Uh, I don't actually think that uh, even humans can read human, uh, <laughs> human minds. You know, as the technology is growing, like the robots can scan the human body. Okay, right, what so. uh, you might find maybe will be circuits added to our neural, con neural connections in the brain that maybe will act as sensors from the outside uh, stimulus to be converted into electronic uh, or, uh, yes, elect electric um, pulses. That way maybe blind people will be able to watch again, to see again, and maybe you can, on the other way, control your limbs just by sending impulses from your brain that have been captured by these uh, sensors and elements in order to trigger movement. But, uh, well, that's the only mind reading I, I actually can uh, think about. Or if you can imagine something and project that something into a screen, well, that could be a good way of reading your mind. Maybe a robot. Uh, will uh, get this input from what you're thinking, not expressing verbally, but just thinking, and store this into some sort of non-volatile memory. Now I see it. Now I see it feasible. <laughs> so I, I, ha I have a, we don't know, truth is we don't know. I have a Project X, where I have a few Project X. One of them is exactly on that. I believe it's doable. And uh, I know, I think I know why it is doable. And, uh, you know, I've gone through a lot of historical records where people talk about stuff which today we would call paranormal. 
in a sense that you feel connected to somebody, right? And stuff like that. So I'm coming to the ground of that based on my background in telecoms, which came uh, very handy in this, but I can't talk much about it because it's my Project X. Just, just, just what's up me in a year's time, I'll let you know. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. In fact, I'll connect with you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that you were asking that. Okay, I think we have time hey. for one more question. Here, here. Should we go over there? Okay, all right, two more. Uh, hello. So talking about the things that nobody thought was possible in the past, a great theoretical physicist, physicist Stephen Hawking, just passed away recently, and I read somewhere that he actually believed in three things. After his death, it was re revealed that he believed in three things. First, there's no God. Second, the laws of nature can answer everything. And thirdly, he believed that the time, time travel is possible. So I don't think I would find better people to comment on that, like around me. So do, do you guys actually believe in that? Or would you share Is that some a religious or scientific question? So. <laughs> the third one, the third You're one. You're asking is the about time the time tra travel thing? The first two actually believe in those, so that's Great. why. And the third one was kind of... I don't know what to think about so that. So you ask you specifically about the time yeah, travel, it's a, right? Think it's, yeah. Okay. I'd love to have it. Anyway, you guys go. Do you believe in time travel? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you should read up on something. Uh, the uh, universe as a simulation. I'm not, is anybody familiar with that concept? Yeah? All of you guys. You're really gr well educated. So here you go, right? So the, there's a theory out there which is... Uh, which actually stimulates that we are not living in the real world. We are part of a computer simulation, possibly a school project of an Uber kid somewhere doing something, okay? And um, so in, in essence of our world, it's like Mario the builder of our computer games at some point figures out that actually he's not real, he's part of a computer game, our computer game, right? And um, the reason for that is, is it lies in a very scientific paper which has been published in Science by some German guys four years back. Very interesting. I'll not go into details. Um, but everybody now suddenly started to see, you know, there might be some basis here that actually we're not real. And uh, there are a lot of glitches in history. There are a lot of glitches in the way how certain uh, physics and information theory and all that connect. A lot of stuff we can't explain, not least about the quantum world. We have never ever observed a truly symmetrical, uh, circular symmetrical orbit of an electron, ever. It was always quantitized, right? And if you look at our world, it's a, the computer world is a quantitized world. So people may ask, you know, maybe we are part of a simulation. And Elon Musk said the chance of us being in a real base world is one to 50 million. Okay, so uh, therefore, you know, I don't want to shock you guys, you know, but once you know this, you know, the whole issue of uh, purpose of life changes completely, at least for me, you know. Um, I'm not sure whether, I'm just telling you what people say, you asked for that, right? So, um, so now there's a huge amount of money being thrown at the best physicists and mathematicians trying to figure out whether that statement is true and how would we observe it. In other words, how would Mario the Builder in our computer game and console start to build evidence to figure out that he's actually not real? Okay, so it's not an easy question. Question number one we're trying to answer is, is once we know that, how can we start manipulating the current uh, laws which govern this universe? In other words, you know, um, something like matrix-like, right? So, it, it, you know, these are questions which very serious mathematicians and physicists post today. Uh, you asked for that, you got the answer. There you go. Yeah, yeah that's the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Okay, I think unfortunately our time is up. Um, Misha has to go and rush off for a taxi. But can I ask for a big round of applause to our panelists? <laughs> it's very um, um, <laughs> um, thank you very much. We thank were you. truly inspired by all of you. Thank you very much for joining thank us. You. Thank you very much. Okay. You. We now have an official photo on stage. So could the first two rows come up, please? Um, a photo with Pepper on stage. Mm -hmm. First, the two rows. Muchísimas yeah. gracias, huh? My God, super interesting.